of course this was just introducing all of you to each other <laughs> that now let's do the official kind of thing first of all thank you very much and of course okay stefan is here so and rosalia is also here they were waiting me for me to go live <laughs> both of them are here <laughs> so let me do a quick <laughs> okay stefan hi stefan stefan is not going to be legal scan you'll have to put your name there i will change it yes and i have to okay and belgium and burundi with it and rosalia you'll have to put hi hi rosalia good morning we are putting countries there just to put the get an idea that we there are diverse views from different perspectives okay. the only thing is because look victor covers africa so he's done south sudan kenya and somalia so africa is covered <laughs> stefan is in burundi okay another africa part covered yeah the dry part is all, is covered <laughs> the tropical part by both of us <laughs> perfect and of course the us and canada are well represented south america maybe next time yeah okay and so, i lived in the middle east for 15 years so covered middle east done <laughs> anyone any south american connections please tell me so we that's also covered okay so anyway so thank you very much all of you to come in and what i'll do is let's just quickly i mean in the sense you don't have to be brief but it'll be better if you brief just a little bit about yourself jay please if you could start with yourself and then we'll move to the others okay so i i go back and forth between uh, academia and practice in between yellow springs ohio in the united states and jerusalem in israel palestine uh, that's where i have mostly plied my trade over the last 35 years um and i resonate very much with the notion of humanistic mediation the core of my work which i'll talk about as i talk about gandhi today is what i call resonance and that's the place in each of us where our our purpose is located and that actually links us to each other even though across our differences we often forget that perfect so then teresa would you want to introduce yourself sure teresa pernell i'm in i'm in florida in the united states and um Uh, um avidly enjoy being in nature and the outdoors and as a part of my um sense of well-being which relates to for me the work that I do in various um job forms of peacemaking um and those job forms include mediation and working in collaborative process um primarily I'm working with individuals who are experiencing some level of personal uh pain as they go through significant transformation and change and uh so so for me being able to create a space where they can um communicate about these really significant life changes and uh collective sort of moments of pain in a family um is a really important endeavor and um I appreciate the opportunity to do the work sometimes it can be um uh, draining as well on one's own soul So when I think about those processes for me it starts with trying to keep myself aligned in some way that I can be present regardless of what's going on before I step in the room being able to be present to 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 serve the people that I'm with for that particular interaction um and I know one of the topics today Vikram I I think that you were hoping we'd get into at least based on the sort of the first uh, portion of this is is you know that that concept of of the the spiritual side of of mediation and and the practical or employment or work side of it and and how we um uh bring those two together and what some of the the, the challenges are including in the different way that people including Gandhi think about uh the purpose of of uh mediation type processes in our society so it's going to be a, a really interesting conversation i'm yeah. looking forward to hear what everyone has to say yep so lisa would you want to just a little bit okay so i have to unmute myself first uh, you can so... you can do you can do it without that also we have no problem because we were we before this we had a session on lip reading so we're all quite experts on that so we totally oh. all <laughs> so please oh well then i'll mute myself again and, and let you read my lips <laughs> <laughs> so I'm Lisa Singh and of course I'm in Ohio near near Jay um and we have to get that lunch we promised Jay. <laughs> so um I 
have been practicing mediation since 1996, but before that, way, way back in the 70s, when I was a college student, I studied Gandhi and I read all of his books and I was very inspired by him. And um, so as a mediator, I think a lot of those values and principles they have become a part of what I do. Anything that I do, I try to inculcate those. And, you know, one of those things is I really, really have so much faith in the human spirit and their capacity to resolve their own conflicts. And I believe that the more that we can bring that out, um, the better we'll be in, as a society. Perfect. So, Victor, do you want to just a little bit? Uh, thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from wherever you are. Thank you for having me, Mr. Vikram. I really wish that I could maybe mention everyone's name, but because of this being a huge group, you'll just allow me to um, just say, distinguish a panelist. Um, I am a mediator. My work centers on um, practice. I'm a practitioner, and most recently, I have sort of migrated into a scholarship. Uh, talking about mediation, definitely uh, our spirit, sp spirituality is a big reservoir that we can all uh, tap into. And I feel that uh, Mahatma Gandhi sort of was an embodiment of that, that when we tap into our spiritual uh, roots, definitely we will prosper. Right now I'm holding a book on my desk called um, Gandhi is the way. I, I don't know if we all have a visual of it. The yeah. book is Gandhi is the answer. And I feel that um, his work is very relevant um, and very contemporary to problems that we are facing right now as humanity. Thank you so much for having me. But Victor, this shirt that you're wearing, this is from which part of Africa? Is it some print, a specific print or something? Uh, this is African... Uh, text from Ghana. Okay. It's from Ghana. Can okay, I write in brackets and the shirt is from Ghana? <laughs> I cover more of Africa that way. <laughs> Can I do that? <laughs> okay, so Stefan, please. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me, Vikram, today. So uh, I'm Stefan Dukopelnikov. Uh, I'm born in uh, Belgium and I was a litigation lawyer in Belgium for 27 years. And uh, I decided to end my career as a litigation lawyer in 2014. At the end of my career as a lawyer or as an attorney, um, I decided that I had to choose whether I stay a lawyer, whether I become a mediator because uh, I was really into the mind, or I had the mind mostly of a lawyer. And uh, at the end of my career, I discovered really mediation and uh, I was very interested in it. So I decided to change to mediation and I studied mediation in Belgium. And after that, because of personal circumstances, I went to Southern Africa and studied mediation also in Africa to see the, the point of view or the perception of mediation in Africa. Though I must say Cape Town is uh, a bit Western. It's not like Central Africa, like Kenya eh? or uh, where I'm now in Burundi. Uh, there is a difference. But it was very interesting and so I also studied uh, on peace, what is peace, how we can uh, come to peace, how can we be in peace. Uh, of course the answer is very simple, peace is always there. Uh, uh, the problem is uh, in our minds to come to peace again and so that's how I connect to the spiritual part uh, of peace and uh, mediation. Perfect. So Rosalia. Thanks. I'm sorry, uh, it's Rosalia. I'm sorry, it's Rosalia. Yes. Grazie. <laughs> um, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. Um, I'm uh, in uh, Canada. I'm in Montreal, in the uh, Quebec uh, um, province, which is the, the French part of Canada. Um, basically, my journey is a, a little similar to Stefan's. I started, uh, I was in law school uh, in the, the 90s and uh, 
uh, I had started off as a, I, I, you know, I, my whole goal was to be a, a litigator. So I started an international trade. The thing is, I started an international trade law. I did arbitration. And as I moved along, I discovered mediation. So I started training in mediation since 1996. And I loved it. I, I felt that it was, uh, it resonated with me. I did practice also international public law. I was uh, at the UN as a legal advisor and I enjoyed it very much. But what, uh, what was always pulling at me was always the, dip the diplomacy side piece, uh, everything dealing with uh, mediation and it, it just resonated with me. It just felt like the right fit for me. Um, litigation, although when I was younger was quite exciting, it just, um, I, 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 I delved into it too. Uh, I had fun with it, but it, it wasn't conducive with my character. So uh, now, uh, presently, I'm, um, I work for the, the Canadian government. I'm a civil servant. I am um, a mediator, and uh, actually, I'm going to be starting full time as a practitioner <laughs> as of next Monday. I'm so happy I got a huge promotion, uh, and it's my dream job, which I've been waiting for because uh, I wanted to uh, continue uh, in the federal with the Canadian federal government. Uh, but I've also uh, worked uh, in the, the private uh, sector. Uh, doing a civil and commercial mediation. Now, Gandhi, I, I studied Gandhi when I was uh, an undergraduate in political science, and I, I do, it, 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 it resonated with me too. There, there's just something, I, I've, I've always been pulled to anything dealing with peace and, uh, you know, peace talks and uh, nonviolence. So I'm happy to be part of this panel and uh, hope uh, and I'm, I'm sure we're going to have a, a wonderful discussion. So full-time mediator is a damn good thing. This is what we need. So damn good. But okay, let me also, also tell you that, of course, tell you, tell Teresa and Jay that you can get to know more about these people. Lisa has been on Evolution of a Mediator. We've had two episodes there, so that's available. She's been on the symposium. She's been, I mean, uh, after that also, so Lisa, you've, been, you've done other shows also, something? Of, of course, okay, these major, and then Victor has yeah. been on mediator experiences. Stefan started off my show in conversation with a beautiful mind. Rosalia has been on in conversation with a beautiful mind. So all you have to do is go to YouTube, just cite mediator Vikram and you can write their names and you'll get those episodes. So please have a look at that. So that is, of course, good introductions, interesting people, interesting background. So we'll, of course, start with Jay. Jay, do you want to just start the discussion? Well, like several others, I was a student of Gandhi in college. I was a history student and I'm, I focused on peace studies. Um, and so I spent some time last couple of days going back over, over Gandhi. I got his autobiography. I got the, uh, the biography by uh, Eric Erickson on Gandhi. Fascinating. And I went in and, and I actually have a little notebook with wonderful Gandhian quotes. So I looked at the wonderful quotes. So I want to share a little bit about, about how I'm remembering and uh, it, Gandhi is sort of centered in my work as, as one who has spent his whole career seeking peace and pursuing it. So Gandhi was clearly at root a man of faith. And this faith sustained his commitment to peace despite everything. And he experienced all the resistance that, that a man whose life devoted to peace would obviously entail. And he believed in it despite, you know, there's this famous quote of him at being asked by a journalist, Mr. Gandhi, what do you think about civilization? And his response is, I think it would be a very good idea. So he had a bitter wit about him. And yet, one of, and the beautiful, another quote of his is, you must not lose faith in humanity. Humanity is an ocean. If a few drops of the ocean are dirty, the ocean doesn't become unclean. And I think that at root is the sort of faithful notion that, that humanity um, is at root in peace, as, as you said, and that we have to rediscover and, and recreate that. At the root of this for Gandhi was the, the philosophy of ahimsa, or truth force, which was his main driver, which is respect for all living things and renunciation of violence. That was his principle. On that, on that he stood. So non-injury, non-violence, non-harm, renunciation of the will to kill and the intention to hurt any living thing. So on a more affirmative note, Right? This is what he would not do, nonviolence. 
passive resistance and so forth. But on a more formative active note, of course, we know that that passive resistance was very, very active and very powerful. And rooted again in a spiritual note that within everybody is this divine, divine spark. And if I'm like you, all of you, in one sort of unified cosmic field, to use a more Latin, current language, then it's my responsibility to deeply understand you as if I were to, even if I don't agree, or maybe especially if I don't agree. And that's, I think, the beginning of, of Gandhi's humanistic, the notion of humanistic mediation. That's sort of, I heard at the last session is where, where people are making a connection between Gandhi and uh, philosophy and mediation. So I wanna read a quote from, from his autobiography, which really embeds this notion of humanism, I believe, so deeply in the Gandhian approach. This is from a chapter called A Tussle with Power. Man and his deed are two distinct things. Whereas a good deed should call forth approbation and a wicked deed disapprobation, the doer of the deed, whether good or wicked, always deserves respect or pity as the case may be. Hate the sin and not the sinner is a, pro is a precept which though, though easy enough to understand is rarely practiced. And that is why the poison of hatred spreads in the world. So rarely practiced. And of course, Gandhi was this great philosopher and this great practitioner, and he interwove them together. One of his, his colleagues in, in the world was Martin Buber, a Jewish philosopher um, who uh, was in exile from Germany before the war and then, and then lived in Palestine. And his work was really about bridging gaps between Arabs and Jews. And he had this amazing su summary of, of conflict. And he said, conflict is when we don't say what we mean and we don't do what we say which is right the opposite of what Gandhi is saying. If we know what we mean, we can do what we say. And in fact, that was Gandhi's prescription for a happy life. He said, a happy person is he who or she who says what they mean and do what they say. So Gandhi and Buber had the reverse notions, but I think they're very connected, which is one of the, the roots of conflict, at least for me and my work, is that it's the source of creativity, right? I'm, I'm interested in art, I'm interested in life, I'm interested in peace like the rest of us. So why have I spent my whole life in conflict? Well, in some of the deepest conflicts between Israelis and Palestinians, between uh, North Catholics and Protestants, between Tamils and Sinhalese, between Greeks and Turks, between Americans, uh, across races, across classes. Why do I work in this? Because I believe it's the source of creativity, of imagination, of creative imagination. And, and I think that's at the core of this Gandhian philosophy, that at the core of everything is this spark that is shared by all of us. And our job is to let it out. Our job also is to discover it. And how do we discover a spark when there's friction, right? How do we create music when there's friction? How do we discover who we are when there's friction? So, so the beginning of wisdom, I think, in our work is to accept radical difference, right? at the same time accepting this absolute fundamental connection. So we begin with acceptance of radical difference. I am not you, I can't be. And yet, because of you, I'm me. <laughs> so, so there's this, this disconnection and this connection that we are working with in conflict and its creative engagement. And, and I believe again, Gandhi in his life, in his work, in his practice, in his absolute fundamental principle of human dignity, human, human purpose, human divinity was able to create a tooth force that brought down an empire and that inspired all of us a hundred years later. So, so that spiritual root, that spiritual core that creates that clarity of who I am, the acceptance of who you are, and then ultimately this effort to merge us into a, a, a single human entity um, is again where Gandhi says to the reporter, civilization would indeed be a good idea. Let's build it. Perfect. Thank so you. now let's just move to Teresa. We'll, we'll do a little kind of an introductory kind of a okay. thing and then we'll open it up. Yeah, Teresa. Uh, so, so thank you, Jay. You know, the, uh, sort of a great foundation, not wanting to repeat some of the, the things that he said. So um, 
maybe some crossover, but let, let me say things perhaps a little bit differently, how I think about them on a day-to-day -day basis in the work that I do. Um, you know, so some of the core concepts that I understand were important to Gandhi and his, his view and his life and his work is this concept of truth, which in day-to-day in -day mediation, at least most of the, the mediations that I do, that comes up in the concept of a, of a family in conflict where their, their perspective is so vastly different and they have difficulty having conversations about those different perspectives with the, the absence of judgment and the radical acceptance that, that Jay was talking about. So, so part of the initial work is, is at least perhaps expanding truth to concepts of, of openness and fairness and, and, and being able to um, uh, hear one another with, without, without judgment. The second part for me that I that I um, that I recognize is this regularly is this concept of of not not injuring others, right? So when I'm working in my, um, for instance, a family law mediation where you have parents who have sometimes perpetrated tremendous injury on one another, and now we're trying to help them find a path forward. Um, where they're, they can, you know, have an opportunity to stop injuring each other within that system um, and therefore provide a different sort of um, opportunity for, for their children. Um, the other part that I think about regularly um, that I mentioned when we opened is, is that concept of starting with, with oneself and, you know, the challenge to embody um, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis and, and all interactions in the office and out of the office, this concept of openness and fairness and lack of injury and patience and, um, uh, and being able to be in that place with the, the clients that we're, that we're working with and knowing for me that every mediation uh, is an opportunity. I, I, you know, Gandhi certainly talked a bit about, you know, the starting with with self and the, the conflict with self, the conflict between two individuals, the conflict in the larger uh, system, in the community, in the world. And um, you know, some of you on this panel clearly have had the opportunities I've never had to work in some of these much broader areas of, of conflict. Um, but the, the work where I am, I always hope that when folks leave that mediation, they've gathered some self insight, they've gathered some insight into the other person, they've expanded their ability to be patient and accepting, and that they've learned some skills that then ripple down into the communications that they have with their own children and their, their opportunity then to model what they haven't been modeling, which is handling difficult, painful situations and being able to interact with one another in a respectful and, and non-injurious way. And obviously, you know, Vikram, you talk a lot about the mediator mindset, and you and I had one sort of, you know, conversation um, with each other, and this concept that certainly some people seem to more naturally, um, uh, more naturally by their their how they're born, by their life experiences, whatever however we want to put that, more naturally have that mediator mindset. But if we're depending upon that alone to help us with our peacekeeping within families and all the way up to, you know, around the world, that's going to be insufficient. And so for me, it's always keeping in mind each of these opportunities in the work that we do to plant seeds that are, are going to hopefully um, grow those skills that are necessary to keep conflict in the realm of creativity and opportunity and, and, and out of the realm of something that is is destructive and and not really life affirming, um, so those are some of the things that continually are part of my prep when I'm approaching a, a mediation or a, a, a collaborative um, meeting, um, because that's those those are the things that I do on a day, on a day to day basis. You know, I, I didn't mention in my opening, not that important, but some of the other panelists. I, I'm not a lawyer. And I never have been. Um, but what I did do in the first two decades of my career was what would be considered litigation support services. 
So all of the things that lawyers needed in family law that were all designed to support the litigation, which is the, the separation, the destruction, the driving people apart, the focusing on the negative aspects. And I was fully ingrained in that world for a, a very long time. Um, like Rosalia, you know, enjoyed certain aspects of it and, and over time um, recognized, for me at least, that I was part of things that were destructive um, rather than productive. And so, although I've been trained as a mediator since the early 90s, really this has been much more part of my day-to-day -day work over the last 10 years um, and certainly see that these Gandhi principles resonate uh, throughout the work that I do, as well as many of the training opportunities that I had. So um, um, I think that's, I think that's enough. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We'll come back. Yeah, we'll come back. But, but Jay and you still use the word creativity. And of course, Jay also said creativity and innovation. So on 21st April, we're having a discussion on creativity, innovation, and mediation. Basically, it's the World Day of Innovation and Creativity, or Creativity and Innovation. So on that day, we're having that discussion. So Teresa's yeah. part of it, Lisa's part of it. The Kathy is coming in. She's, of course, been talking about art and mediation and poetry and mediation. So we'll have that discussion there. So I'm just, I mean, picking up from what your people said. Yes, Lisa, please. Okay, so um, where to begin? It's like so vast to me. Um, so for me, when I think about it a lot and what has informed me is, is just even thinking about Gandhi starting out as learning law. I mean, being just as you all have said, two of you at least have talked about going to study law and then finding something else. I think Gandhi shares that path as well. And some of the things that really inspired me, are, he talks about, um, he talks about living, you know, our actions today are going to inform what happens later. So everything we do today, it's going to bleed into the future. It's going to lead into the future. So we have a tremendous responsibility if we think about that for how we act. And this, this idea of satyagraha is like satya is truth and graha is holding firmly to it. So that's living the truth. We talk about it, I think, in terms of authentic self. You know, today we will say, oh, I'm my authentic self, but that's just really about living our truths, really being firm to our truth and our values and making sure that we ourselves inculcate that. And I think as mediators, you know, it's very important that we are living the truth that we want to see in others. So he says that as well, you know, start with ourselves, don't start with others. Um, and, and I think about the power, because if you think about how his actions lead into everything. Yesterday, I was uh, at a, um, another workshop and they talked about how nonviolent action that really this very idea that stemmed from Gandhi is being used in Ukraine. At one place, uh, one of the stories are that a lot of people that when the soldiers arrived, the Ukrainians met them with coffee and tea or, uh, and food. And, and that diffused a lot of the tension. And so one of the ways that they are really having an impact is through meeting the Russians with nonviolent actions. And, and I think that this is known very well to governments that any country that meets them with nonviolence, with Gandhian principles, cannot rule that country. That's how it's one of the, the things that took the British out of um, India. So this power of nonviolence, this power of people and each individual really bleeds into that. And as you know, conflict professionals or professionals in the conflict field, you know, those are things that 
that we want to see happening, that, uh, that these are values that we hold as well. I mean, I think about ahimsa is that, you know, do no harm. That's one of the things that mediators say, do no harm. It is the ah, uh, which means absence and ahimsa, that harm, that violence. So that, you know, that principle is something that we all want to do. That's why we mediate. We want to see people, you know, move from that. Um, so I think, you know, that's, oh, well, I'm, I'm running out of steam. So that's my beginning. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Victor, Victor, please. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Um, lots have been said. I feel like Lisa's, you know, sort of stole the words at the Agraha from my heart, but that's okay. Um, I will take it that way. I'd like to maybe marry the work of uh, Gandhi or the ideals of Gandhi to my personal life as a human being. And that goes, that goes back to my formative years as a young man before I went to law school. And I had just stumbled into the work of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, and and part of and part of that was because of my you know background, having from a conflict prone a kind of a background. So I really wanted to engage into activism. I, I'm really hoping that you know one of these days I'll still become an activist. So it's it's in my bucket list. Let me put it that way. So when I looked into the work of Dr. Martin Luther King, um, how he talked about. Uh, non-violence, intolerance, bigotry, and all that kind of a thing. I don't want to bore you people. Probably you have read a couple of his biographies by different uh, people and so on and so to speak. So uh, three things that I, I looked into the life of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. And if you look at the speeches of Martin Luther King, you look at his writings, he's always referenced Mahatma Gandhi. So I, I stumbled into the work of Mahatma Gandhi through um, a great man called Dr. Martin Luther King. And that's the beauty of books. You know, books can introduce us to people that are here and people that are not here anymore. So once I stumbled into the work of Mahatma Gandhi, um, I'm told he's called Mohandas Kamrachand Gandhi. Um, Karamchand, yeah, uh, yeah. Karamchand, Karamchand, right? Yeah. I hope I'm getting it right. Yeah. Oh, thank you. So when I got into his work and he talks about truth and love, and these are two uh, concepts that have always um, been presented to us as uh, maybe wrestling components. They are always antagonistic. But when you look at the life of Mahatma Gandhi and of course other personalities, um, I have to mention um, Nelson Mandela, who's as well greatly uh, borrowed a leaf or two of his ethics from Mahatma Gandhi. How he's able to put these two components together, the truth and love is just amazing. And these are things that I think as mediators at times, we, uh, we, we, we don't engage them. We don't inculcate them into our work. And then maybe uh, let me talk of, uh, an important thing that I, that I have read in the life of Mahatma Gandhi, and that would be the fact that he speaks about service without self. And then he goes on and says that, you know, action without being attached. And these are values that are very fundamental and instrumental to the life of a mediator, because as a mediator, you have no stake whatsoever in the conflict that, has, that is before your desk. And we are told to try as much as possible, you know, to, to, to divorce ourselves from the case. And this is what, Dr. This is what uh, Mahatma Gandhi is preaching, that, you know, we should, be, we should offer our services to humanity without self. And again, there I see love. Um, I'm sorry to put it this way, but uh, love is, is, is one of the things that is losing its essence and definition and meaning in our world today. Because when I say that I love, for instance, Vikram, uh, one of the meanings of that is to say that my, I have no self-interest whatsoever. And, and these are philosophical questions that at times are difficult really to pin down. C can you love somebody uh, without having self, 
within that atmosphere of love. And so these are wonderful values that as a, as a mediator, I feel um, every mediator needs to uh, look at. And then of course, he speaks about a change beginning from self, very fundamental and uh, relevant to today's world because we, we all want to uh, be the next Superman. We all want to be uh, um, the next uh, Barack Obama, but there's always a place where to begin uh, from and that place has got to be self. And then marrying that maybe to spirituality, I feel that the life of Gandhi is like a canvas where we see uh, divinity and humanity coming together. We see uh, values that are common to divinity and values that are common to humanity. And as a practicing Christian, um, I see the Bible as a love story. It's a love story between divinity and humanity and humanity and divinity, and that's that's that has always been the position where divinity and humanity coming together. And every other time we marginalize divinity, every other time humanity marginalizes divinity, there is powers or there are resources that we lose on it. So I see Mahatma Gandhi in that sense as as a person who transcended, you know, the limitations of humanity, and he was able to trap certain uh, values that can only be found in divinity. And, and spirituality is, this is something that we all identify with, whether we know it or not. It, it's just the root of who we are. And a tree that has no roots, I'm sorry to say this, or you'll forgive my language, it's like a dead living tree. And, and, and that's the embodiment of Mahatma Gandhi, his ability to um, go into spirituality and peak values that he has used to change his society and change um, his and change the world he's changed the world practically because today we have a day that is named and permitted to him and Victor, he's called mahatma that's a title given to him mahatma atma means soul and maha means great so oh, that's wow. why that's why it's mahatma so it's not wow. it's so and the other thing is victor it's the easier bucket list is go and see the Northern Lights much better. <laughs> Why do you put these complicated things of activism and all? <laughs> so, uh, Stefan, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, a lot interesting is uh, already said. So, for me, when I think of uh, about Mahatma Gandhi, I also think about, uh, like Victor already said, uh, because yeah, we are in Africa here, Nelson Mandela. Both were lawyers and both were, in a way, um, reacting to a um, system, to a society um, that was uh, not good. And uh, when, when is something is not good, that it is when uh, something is created by humans, created by human minds that doesn't contribute to the well-being of yourself and the well-being of others. So for me, Mahatma Gandhi, Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King, all these people, Mar uh, Mother Teresa in India, they were acting to show that there cannot be one human being considered better than another human being. The question is, how did they, they get there? How did they get to, to the decision for them to be non-violent and to to come from a compassionate mind, because in all of them, they are symbols of compassion. So that means that they go beyond the ego, beyond their own personal mind. To understand others, they see it as a human duty, not to think about yourself, but to 
try even when you you are in conflict with others you feel in conflict emotionally by your intelligence you are judging others your first duty is always to understand the other and that is what we try as mediators we we have to take distance from our own judgments when we see both parties no Last week we were talking, I want to connect it to the conversation we had uh, about Socrates, who is the father of questioning. Because when you think about trying to understand others is by questions you ask. Genuine questions, like I want to know you, I want to understand you. And that is connected to compassion, in compassion and as a mediator, you ask questions with the real intention to try to understand the other and to see where you can really help the other. You want to help the other person. And people on, on, on that level of consciousness, because People like Gandhi, people like Nelson Mandela, all these people, they are beyond intelligence. Intelligence is just a tool like any other tool we have. So this is the thing. Socrates introduced intelligence to the Western world. He is the father of Western thinking also. But now I come back to Victor, what he said. What about love? Love has nothing to do with intelligence. Love is beyond the mind. When you say you love Vikram, it could be interpreted in a negative way, but it can be interpreted beyond the mind, only from the heart and the soul also. So there is Mahatma Gandhi, the great soul. The soul is eternal. Our minds they are temporary. So it's the connection you have with what is the universe, which was eternal, and the connection with what you have is, is temporary. The mind is temporary. And we have to be conscious of that. And as mediators, we have to be conscious that the mind of every person created is different. The perception of each person from what it perceives is different. That's why it's so important to try to understand the other person. Another conclusion is that it's very important to understand what is from the mind and what is not from the mind. Peace is not from the mind. Love and peace, they are beyond our human minds. And uh, I, I am a coach also, so I do coaching of personal development and I have these young people I coach, I do life coaching. And uh, the, the, this afternoon they asked me, Stefan, you, you are from uh, which, uh, what religion? And I say, what do you think? And they say, I don't know. And they don't know what religion uh, I have. And then the second question they ask, so I didn't answer the question. Somebody asked, what do you think is the best religion? And I said, this is a very interesting question. I say, what do you think if you belong to one religion and you ask yourself, what is the best religion? I say, this competition that you create is from the mind. A religion is created by the human mind. So when these young people ask, I ask them, what do you want to become in life? What do you want to achieve in life? Because they come from poverty, they are in poverty. A lot of them say, I want to become rich. And they want to become rich, really rich by money, okay? And I say, so you are poor. And I explain to them, to me, you are rich. <laughs> and they say, but we are not rich. 
I say yes, but it depends how you judge what richness is. Richness is also beyond the mind. The richness in life. I say, for example, if you are going to consider richness compared to money, you have to understand that the money that exists now is created by the human mind and that, that money doesn't have value by itself besides the value we as human beings give to what we created. So I say to them, which is more important to you? I ask them, a tree or money? And most will say money, not a tree. And I ask them, okay, can you create a tree? And they cannot create a tree. We cannot create a tree. While this tree is giving us fruit, food, oxygen, but we cannot create it. Money is giving us nothing. So what does this have to do with mediation? Mediation is everything to do with it. Mediation is there to bring people back to the essence. It is the whole. When we are confronted with conflict, it is uh, important to situate that conflict where it's coming from. Mostly, to me, it's coming from the human mind. Somebody was saying, I'm very connected to nature. Me too, I love nature. I live on a hill here, very connected to nature amongst the poor people here in Burundi. Why do I do that? To go back to nature, to go back to the essence. Why I'm in touch with poor people by money is to understand what the problem is. And also in Burundi to understand why there is this continuous circle of violence. And this problem you cannot solve by giving money. You can solve this problem only by trying to understand the human mind of these people in the conflict without judging them. And the problem, the cause of most conflict is judgment. So this a little bit to situate what happened to me coming from a lawyer to becoming a mediator, to try to contribute to peace. So and all these people, Nelson Mandela, Mahatma Gandhi, they are examples of being beyond the mind, not to be limited by the human mind, but energized by love and compassion. On the questioning part Thank of it, first of all, yeah, that Socrates and mediation was a very interesting session. Please watch it. It's on YouTube. And on the 29th, I'll just take you through that. There is an interesting session we're having. Someone who's written a book on questions and all that. So we'll also, I'll take you through that also. Yes, Rosalia. Last but not the least. Okay. Well, how can I add to so much um, a wonderful, uh, rich uh, session? Uh, you pretty much covered uh, a lot of the ideas that I've, I've been swimming in my head. Um, for me, when I think of Gandhi, what uh, I think of nonviolent communication, and that's how I um, I basically um, related to mediation, to the practice of mediation and uh, uh, co conflict management and resolution. Um, Yes, uh, also coming from a legal background, um, I have, I did my evolution. What I noticed, I did notice um, a commonality with Gandhi, Martin Luther King, uh, Nelson Mandela. Yes, they all have a legal background. What always, uh, what always um, impressed me is they used that knowledge from their legal background and um, you know everything, the knowledge of fundamental rights, the violation of fundamental rights, fundamental principles, and they took it a step further. And that's what resonated with me. 
because I, as when I was practicing as a legal practitioner, what I didn't like, uh, what I detested about the, the profession for me, uh, that, that didn't suit my personality, was the competitiveness. I, I, you know, it's win at all costs. Well, that didn't resonate with me. I remember being in a hearing room, and um, at the time, I was uh, part of uh, the with the Canadian government. It was at the beginning, tw over twenty years ago. I. I had refugees before me and I had to question them. And I, I said, you know, I put everything aside. I still remember I, I had everything prepared, the Socratic style of questioning and whatnot. I just took my notes, tossed them aside. And I said, you know what, forget it. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to win this one. And it was the best, uh, the best trial I ever had. I, I just asked them why, you know, why are you here? This and and I, had, I had this woman that had been abused it was a very, very, um, it was a case which, rest, which stayed with me for the longest time. I even had dreams, nightmares, because I couldn't believe what this woman had gone through. And I still remember we accepted her on the spot as a, you know, as a refugee, because, uh, and her lawyer, her lawyer that was representing her <laughs> was actually frustrated because he, had, he didn't have the chance to present this case. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I said, you know, we're giving you a freebie and, and you're frustrated. But anyhow, coming back to, the, to all this, is, that's when I realized, you know what? I, I, I think I need to move on. Uh, and, and I started heading towards uh, mediation. Now, what resonates with me, with mediation, with Gandhi, is the nonviolent communication, compassion, showing people compassion. And that's what we need to bring into... Um, our, uh, I wouldn't call it hearing rooms, but when we're, we're in the middle of a mediation or uh, conflict coaching or any ADR uh, alternative dispute uh, method, I think what we need is compassion, the non-judgment exactly. Uh, and I feel that that's what uh, Gandhi, um, he went a step further. He used his knowledge, his legal knowledge, and he did, he did go a step further in uh, his spiritual side and, and that, that nonviolent communication, I think it is extremely important that um, we, we, uh, we practice that in, in uh, the profession of uh, mediation. I'm not gonna go further because I, I, I know there's a lot of uh, ideas on this, team, uh, on this panel. Um, and I'd, I'd like to hear more from uh, the more experienced uh, members around the, this panel. Thank you. Now, only thing with the first person who starts, Jay, is the one he keeps himself very, very brief and thinks that everyone else will also be brief. <laughs> but obviously, by the time every it comes to everyone, they're not so brief. So please, you now it's your chance to be a little more elaborate. Okay, thank you. I actually did cut half of what I wanted to say. So, so um, in my work, primarily between Israelis and Palestinians, I encountered a... Uh, Palestinian organizer who, who encapsulated our field in two words. She had been organizing her community of Palestinian citizens of Israel to really assert their, their needs and their identities and their rights more fully in the society. And she'd worked for years. And there'd been some very difficult newspaper articles about her. And I was actually consulting to the Israeli government about how to accept these ideas because they were challenging. And I went to interview her and I said, can you summarize all this work that you've done? in all these years, and I'll summarize down to a 150 page book. She said, yes, I can do it in two words. I said, wow, that's amazing. What are they? Please listen. In some ways that can also be the summary of our field, but I think our field might have some more operational ideas that all, I think also can find some, some grounding in Gandhi. And these are really, well, not long ago, I was asked on a, on a podcast about division in America, United States, which is very intense. Sometimes I think I'm back in the Middle East in terms of the identity conflicts that are happening here, uh, identity-based conflicts. I was asked if I could summarize our field. And so I thought back to this woman and I said, maybe I'll say, please listen. And I thought, no, actually, I think in our field, it's take perspective. What all of you have really been saying, that our capacity to take the perspective of another person especially when we disagree with them, when we have fundamentally di fundamental disagreements. In, 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 there's a theory of democracy which says democracy grows out of agonism, which is radical difference. 
So difference is not the problem in our world. Difference is the engine of creativity. D difference is, is what life is all about. It happens through the diversity and interaction of difference. So the problem is how do we live with difference more effectively? And the first answer is accept it, right? I think, I think we've gotten past, many of us anyway in the world have gotten past the idea that there is um, a, a majority that the minority should melt into. There's this, this assimilationist trend, I think. Um, you know, we're seeing, we're seeing these grand fights between East and West, between um, Eurasian ideology and Western ideology right now. Um, in this fight in Ukraine, right? So, so we have these tremendous poles, and yet, yet within these poles are these attractions. And the attractions can come when we're able to deeply take perspective of the other and discover that that other has something that we lack, right? So there's this synergy where, where first we separate and then we discover integration, not, not assimilation, but complex integration or, or amalgamation of the differences that then together work harmoniously. This is rather abstract, but what's not abstract really, and, and back to, I think it was Ro Rosalia who talked about this, back to how can we fundamentally understand the other person's why? And, and to get deeply into their skin, and here's where I'm not sure I agree with the notion of self-abnegation ab that I think is core to a philosophy of nonviolence, that I, I, am, I am nothing. I am, I'm humble for sure, but, but I think we are the source by which we understand the other, right? So as, as mediators, I think all of us have had the experience, uh, my favorite word also, Rosalia, is resonance, and that we resonate with our, with our clients. We resonate with the people who are, whose, whose space, we're, we're holding the space for them. It's very easy to be judgmental. Um, we're conditioned to do that. But we also find this place in which we can resonate with, with these radically different disputants from ourselves, from our own experiences, from our insights, from our own universalism. That's the core of our spark. And that's what's almost a divine experience when mediation has that flow to it, that we deeply understand each other, both of them. And then our job is to help build a bridge where they can walk over to the other side and see the world from the other one and then walk over to the other side and see the world from the other one and then find a way into the middle where they create something that didn't exist before. So again, I think the summary of our field is perspective taking and the job of the mediator, the humanistic mediator is to resonate deeply with the parties and then help them resonate with each other about how they see the world and then if there's a way that can be bridged so that together we, they can create a new world which is different from how they separately see it and op oppositionally see it. So thank you, Victor. So we don't have anyone from South America on the panel, but Alexander, who is in Brazil, has just put a comment. So let me just read it out. Congrats to the participants and Mahatma Gandhi is an extra extraordinary example of a great mind and a human being. He started fighting and ended his life doing, doing a peaceful revolution. I admire him and Nelson Mandela is two of the greatest of all times. Thank you, Alexander. If anything else, please put, put it in the comments. Yes, Teresa, do you want to take it further from where you left? I think my, uh, my mouse working again. It was uh, yeah. it was silent. Stefan, did you want to go ahead? Yes, uh, there was a comment. I couldn't follow uh, Vikram. Can you place that comment or question in the chat here? Uh, it's just a comment. Yeah, I'll put it there. I'll just a just a general comment on. Okay. I'll put that. I'll put it in the chat in any case. Yeah. Okay, yes, Teresa. Thank you. Yes, Teresa. So, you know, I was listening to. Um, uh, to everyone, as Rosalia said, I mean, th th there's really so much. I mean, there's there's already so much, um, so much out there to think about. Uh, and I, I know this is a very simple sort of back to the beginning piece. And maybe this was Lisa that commented on it, but sort of back to the beginning for Gandhi of where I think transformation began to occur for him. That very simple deciding that the the true function of a lawyer was to unite, and so you know, throughout um, even Jay, your, your comments that you just made there, um, it, it is that building that bridge and between these individuals that we're working with in mediation, um, continually um, on, on all levels within the mediator, 
looking to, to create that sense of understanding and build that bridge because what, what I hope at least is that we move them toward um, being more united in terms of taking one another's perspectives. And for me, united is not the same as agree, um, but, but it is being able to, to sort of sit in that, that seat to take that perspective and then to be united in, and what do we do next? So for the, for the work that I do, right, is it's what do we do next? Because you can't just stay in, okay, we, we have some understanding of each other. We have some perspective, we have some, some deeper knowledge. That's a, that's a wonderful, powerful, um, necessary part of transformation. But then, you know, what, what do we do next? Yes, Lisa, what do we do next? What do we do next? I don't know what we do next. You have to unmute yourself next. That is what you have to do next. Yes. But I'm you've already done that. Yes, now you've done the next step. <laughs> Everything changes from there once you've unmuted yourself. Everything changes from now. So, you know, I've been giving this a lot of thought. And like I had said, uh, sort of in the beginning, Gandhi's journey, I mean, first to the UK, then to South Africa, he also was taking in a lot of knowledge from all the cultures he was in. And of course that Jay's word resonates with me um, because I've lived overseas. I've lived in Indonesia, I've lived in India. I've had these different cultural experiences. And I don't think when I first studied Gandhi, I appreciated it as much until I lived it. And I recognize that how much we learn from being able to have a wider perspective. And a lot of people don't have that. And I was also looking at, you know, in the last few days, you know, I, I came across an article about dogs. So, okay, dogs, guess what? They resolve their disputes without killing each other. And then I thought, I mean, very rarely do they kill. I'm like, wow, what is that all about? And then I studied a little bit more and I found out that of all the species in the you know, world, we are like 30th in terms of killing our own. There are at least 29 other species that kill their own. But interestingly enough, um, all the other species generally kill the young. They murder the, they kill the young of other females because then they can take the females over into their pack or, but we as a species have gone one step further into killing people, adults. Adult killing is something, you know, unique that we kind of, I don't know if maybe it's totally unique, but it is something that we moved into. So then I thought, why is that? And I think this spiritual essence, this, this gift that we were given of being able to make a choice and not live within instinctual behavior took us in a direction where we started to use that and that violence. And so now it's this relearning because also as a species, if you look at the arc of human history, we've become less violent. So somehow, and there are times of violence and times of nonviolence. And so in this arc of us as a species, we had to learn how to do it. And this idea of communication, we have within us the desire to be at peace. We have within us all of that, but we also have the power to choose. And how can we bring people together so they belong. When I think about identity, I think about identity separates us, but identity can bring us together. Just, I'm speaking Jay's word, sorry, Jay. <laughs> and, and in the sense that redefining our identity as us rather than them, redefining our identity is what will bring us together. And I think that is exactly what Gandhi was trying to do. When Gandhi talked about, the, there was the story, and I know everyone knows the story, that when um, a Hindu family came and their son was killed, 
you know, and they wanted to know what to do. He said, adopt a Muslim child and raise him as a Muslim. This was his idea of making it us. It's not just, you know, what happened. And, and that's, that was revolutionary in a way. And in those ways, those are the ways we can move forward, that we move from, okay, you are like this, you know, and we talk about, you know, groups in the U.S., it's Republicans versus Democrats, but it's us. We're all part of the human family. Um, how do we widen that identity? And the other thing is that I, I was just um, looking at a book, I haven't finished reading it, about the neuroscience of war. And one of the things that um, is, is in this book, and it's, it's just published, it's amazing, is that the one thing that separates us is belonging. And there was this movement after 9-11 in the US from people being more open-minded to people becoming more conservative. And that that sense of belonging then in my mind seeped into you know, separation because you feel safer in your small group and in your divisions. And then you'll believe anything that your group believes because you want to belong. And so if we can increase that, if we can widen the sense of belonging, because we all know we belong to each other, then, you know, that, that is what, to me, what Gandhi was trying to, to bring about. He was trying to say, we all belong to one another. Having been in all these different cultures, he's also knew that everyone had a voice and everyone's voice was important and he wanted to bring them together. So for me, I guess that's what, speaks to me. My words different than yours, Jay, are not so much resonance, but intentional, because I believe that what our truth is, sometimes we don't know. And if we can be more aware of our own truth, we can be more intentional. And being more intentional helps us. It gives us confidence to open up to others. So really having or learning to be introspective and learning our truth, that intentionality to me is important. Well, I think, okay, so today's keyword is resonance and resonate and everyone has to use that in whatever they say for sure. It has to come in, otherwise you're not allowed to speak the next time. I used it. <laughs> Only, Lisa, do you think there is, uh, maybe we, it's, it's good that we don't, I mean, the animal kingdom doesn't have a discovery channel looking at us and learning from us. <laughs> if we want to learn Very from good. Them. <laughs> maybe that's, that's okay. Maybe, maybe the world is still the way it is because they don't watch us. So, Victor, please. I thank you so much. Allow me to say that this is such a perfect opportunity for me just to convene and convene and learn from the feet of um, my panelists who I think are great in their diversity in some of the things that they have just said. And I think I just want to maybe pick a number of words uh, that have been spoken. Um, and Teresa spoke about, you know, building a bridge. Lisa has spoken about intentionality and Jay spoke about a resonance. And I, I want to look at it from this, um, lens, um, Mahatma Gandhi and the role of a mediator. Uh, one thing that I, uh, that I have identified um, when I look at the work of Mahatma Gandhi would be the fact that he has this ability to create an energy level uh, that transcends people's beliefs, an energy, a ball of energy where people, you know, where antagonism sort of dissolves. And I think as um, and we should be intentional about that. As mediators, we need to be intentional about that in the sense that it's our role to create a ball of energy where our clients or um, disputants, when, when they come into this energy level, uh, their belief systems, uh, their, uh, their interests, you know, uh, come together or align. And, and that's where I see a bridge. In, in this energy level, uh, people get to breed their differences. And then um, intentionality as well, you know, uh, mediators should be intentional about creating this energy level where uh, um, people come into this space and, and they begin to see uh, themselves as one, where you versus me 
um, dissolves into the atmosphere. And then again, um, Jay spoke about resonance. You know, the energy level should should make the parties uh, resonate rather than see themselves as you versus me. In the African culture, we have this thing called Ubuntu. I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not so sure whether we, 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 we are all familiar with that, but I'll just assume that we are familiar with that. And in a nutshell, Ubuntu is that you are because of me and I am because of you. So Ubuntu in, in, in some sense is a ball of energy where as a community, we, we, we all sit down and we resonate and, and we should be intentional about it where we, we build bridges. That's what I would say uh, for now. Thank you. And good part is you use resonance in your what you said. So you can we can come to you after this. Otherwise, you were out from the list. <laughs> yes, Stefan. Although Stefan, you did elaborate, but please, if you want to add something more. No, thank you. Uh, I talked a, a long time at the moment. Uh, I have nothing uh, specific to add. Okay, Rosalia. Yeah. Because after this, what will happen is then you, after that, we can do cross here and there, whatever, whoever wants to raise their hand and come in. So, Rosalia, please. Okay, well, speaking of resonance, we have a perfect example a few days ago and the, the sense of belonging, that little girl that stood up um, in Poland and, and sang the Ukrainian national anthem. Now, that was a moment of resonance. I mean, I mean, I, if anybody saw that on the news, I, I know I was moved. I, you know, I, she's a perfect example also of uh, nonviolent, uh, <laughs> nonviolent resistance. A little seven-year-old. Um, I, 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 that's the image that I have in my mind right now. Uh, you know, Lisa, you were talking about uh, people needing a sense of belonging, you know, if, if that didn't, uh, if you see the images of um, that moment when she was singing the national anthem and uh, in a stadium with everyone with their uh, flashlight, um, whatever, their uh, not flashlights, their uh, lighters on and, and their, their cell phones, it was just incredible. She could move uh, not only a stadium, but the world and, and, and in, a, in, her, in her little way, it's a uh, nonviolent resistance. She's, uh, she's imitating uh, sort of uh, Gandhi's, uh, <laughs> Gandhi's way. And yes, um, so getting back to also uh, um, what everyone was saying is that we do need to bring um, to the mediation table, uh, it's that sense of belonging, that sense of not being judged uh, this, the, the resonance, exactly. That's what, uh, that's what pulled me towards mediation. Okay. Uh, it's resonating with, with uh, the parties, uh, but also creating that safe space, um, for, for the parties to be able to, you know, uh, to open up and, 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 and to tell us their stories, uh, you know, and, and for us to be able to question them, uh, without, um, judgment, to question, to listen to them, and and to connect, and and, and so that we can help them to build the, the bridge has to be built uh, by them, by the parties, because we we don't have to we we don't have to forget that they're basically um, uh, we're just facilitating. We need to we you know we're we're just facilitating the mediation process, but in the end, if there's no will uh, for them to reach the. Uh, to reach some sort of agreement, it's never going to happen, and they have to be ready for that. So I, I think um, we have that responsibility. And, and how do we do that? Again, it's uh, non-judgment, and also I go back to non-violent communication, ensuring that there's non-violent communication at the table. I think uh, Jay wants to say something. So Jay, I'll, can, so uh, Jay can only say something if I ask him to say it, because obviously I am still yeah. coordinating the process. So Jay, I'll let, get you in after the fact. Look, we, whatever we've said seems very simple. Everyone should understand this. But after all these years, when Gandhi has already left this planet, wherever he's gone, we are still talking about it. Where is the issue? Why are we still talking about such basics? Where have we gone wrong? What is what has happened? So, Jay, please. That also, I mean, what you were going to say, please say that, but please. Yeah, also no, I, I think that connects. I want to come back to Stefan's point about uh, heart and mind. And 
And I think, and I'll say resonance now, I think the resonance is heart, right? It's, it's, it's a separate heart that, that where I understand what's most important to me, I have that, I have that intentionality awareness. I, I understand your heart to some extent, and then we have a unified heart. So, so that's beyond, beyond our thinking and it's to that deepest space of our, of our spark. But if we get back to the head, then I think we have res dissonance actually, right? We have dissonance, we have antagonism, we have agonism, we have difference. And, and that's how our world's created, right? We are, we are human beings, um, which includes, you know, partly animal, which means instincts, which means flight, fight, all the things that, that organize our, our mental capacities, which of course, which also distinguishes us from, from animals is that we have this, this uh, neocortex and the amygdala and all those things that have us reacting and, and choosing. Um, so, so I guess one of the mistakes I think our field might fall into too much um, is overemphasizing resonance. We need dissonance. We have religions for a reason. We have different groups for a reason. And it's about belonging. It's back to what Lisa said. We all need to belong. We need to be part of something. We need to believe something. We have to have hope. Question is, do we have to have it in opposition to others? Right, that's, that's the human, human enterprise is to figure out how we can belong without saying, I am who I am because I'm not you. I am who I am and who I am has all sorts of wonderful things. And you are who you are and who you are has all sorts of wonderful things. And they don't have to be the same. In fact, they're not. So each of us are different. We're separate. We disagree fundamentally, right? I have a religion and probably I believe it's better. Otherwise, why wouldn't I hold it? But it doesn't mean that I'm better. It just means that the approach that I have chosen or been born into is one that fits me and you yours, and that's fine. So we don't have to bridge that. We have to accept it. We have to respect it, says Gandhi, right? That's the ultimate respect of life. Or, or uh, um, uh, um, reverence for life. I'm forgetting uh, the great philosopher, uh, also Bach scholar, I'll remember his name in a minute. His notion was reverence for life because we live uh, and by living, we, we kill things, even walking on the ground, we kill insects or, or whatever, or eating food, we destroy things. Our job as, as those who have reverence for life is to contribute to life, to multiply life, to support life. So, so how is it that through my belongingness, I gain strength and clarity and coherence to support life and to build the bridges across my understanding and your understanding. So there's a new understanding and a new, not that, there's, that we lose our identities, but that we also have a super, super identity that's beyond and above and attaching all of it. So again, just to summarize, peace is not about the absence of things. In fact, here's, here's a wonderful quote from Gandhi. So a no uttered from the deepest conviction is certainly better than a yes, merely uttered to please or worse to avoid trouble. We have to clarify our differences. You know, I, I also was very moved by the, by the young woman that you're talking about singing Ukrainian anthem, Rosalia. And that was, a, that was a nationalist statement, right? That was against Russia, right? And, and it feels pretty good to be for the Ukrainian nationalists and against Russia. It does, and it feels correct. And it's, it's not hard to begin to call Putin evil, but that doesn't do us any good. And in our job, right, as mediators, as people seeking a third way, we have to try the hardest to understand what are the drivers if we're gonna ever change them into some future where the mind is more beholden to the heart. The heart is speaking louder than the mind in some ways, but we accept that the mind and its differentiations are the reality of life. Anyway, St Stephen, I'd love to hear you, you sort of deepen that. Yeah, Stefan will come to that. But I was asking you, Jay, that in terms of the simplistic things that we told Gandhi was talking about and heart, soul, spirituality, these are basic parts. But why are we still talking about it? Why is it not part of the, the way people are, the way people deal with each other? Where, where, where have things gone wrong there? You mean in terms of our us versus them? Our, no, our no, just the, no, I mean, simple concepts. I'm just saying there's such simple concepts to talk about and everyone should be following it instead of us even discussing it today and saying this should be part of what people do and how they deal with each other. What, what, where, have, where, where have we gone wrong? Well, I guess I wouldn't mind using, using a little bit of a Jewish theology approach here, which is 
in, in Jewish theology, we say that everybody has a good inclination and an evil inclination. It's just part of us. And you can, you can those, those bring those back to original sin if you want to in a Christian perspective or um, perhaps reincarnation. I don't know from a, from a Hindu or Buddhist perspective. You can use all sorts of religious approaches to this notion that we are divided by a good and an evil inclination. And, and our job, of course, is to feed one and to uh, have the other one fast. Right, that, that, and Gandhi showed us that, right? When, when his world, either inside, because of any, any of his own um, belief that he was not meeting his own aspirations or the world around him, he would fast. And the fasting was in fact to try to starve the evil inclination, truly, and to try to raise up the, the good inclination. But that's the, that's the human condition, right? That's what we're here for. We're here to, to engage that struggle. We're given the free will, says Lisa, to make some choices. Um, and our job as mediators is to support the effort for the good inclination to, to win the race and the evil inclination to be subservient to it, not to go away. Without that evil inclination, we may not have ambition. We may not, we may not you know, create the new worlds that we have to create. So we don't, it's not about getting rid of that evil part of ourselves, but it's subordinating it to the better, better, better natures, better angels of human nature. And so it's just our, it's just the reality, Vikram. It's just the human condition. And we're not doing well enough of winning the race for the, for the good inclination. And the evil inclination um, seems to be uh, having ascendancy these days. So all the more work for us. So, Stefan, so Victor, Victor was saying something. I'll just get, come to you after the Victor, you were saying something? You had your hand. Yeah, I just up. wanted to uh, make a follow up to what. Uh, Jay said, you know, the heart and the mind. And one of the things that Mahatma Gandhi mastered was the ability to speak with his mind and his heart. Uh, I don't think that the farthest distance is between the North Pole and the South Pole. I am of the opinion that the farthest distance is between our mind and our hearts. And, and that's, a, that's where the problem lies in. You, you are asking, why is it that we can't practicalize, you know, some of these great things that we that we identify or some of these great ideals that we resonate with when we look at the life of Mahatma Gandhi. That's where the thing is. We don't speak with our minds and our heart. We are yet to harness that ability where um, a public figure is able to speak with their heart and mind simultaneously. If you ask me, that's where the problem is. And the solution can only be when we get to master the ability to speak with our mind and our hearts at, at, at a go, hand in hand. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, Stefan. Yeah. Um, I didn't uh, say anything when it came to um, the, the aspect of belonging. Um, because if you see, for example, my, my way of life, my soul is uh, in a way partially Russian or universal. I don't know anymore. Uh, uh, there was a moment in my life that people thought I was lost as a person. And I make jokes now uh, at international conferences. Maybe, okay, that's years ago. Huh? I have uh, an identity crisis. So because I am of Russian descendants, which is not popular these days, my children bear the consequences of that in living in Belgium and in Swaziland. While we, uh, my family escaped Russia 100 years ago, more than 100 years ago, because my grand-grandfather was decapitated during the Russian Revolution. So what we have left is a Russian name and partially a Russian part of the Russian soul, which is in, in us. The soul is beyond the mind, beyond the heart. Okay, That is the eternal connection that I was talking about, eternal energy. So as a mediator, I have uh, an advantage as a mediator, as a quality of a mediator, in that way that I don't, I transcend belonging. It makes it easier for me to be neutral in a mediation because 
I live with, I live and I am of different cultures. I don't belong nowhere. I transcended the belonging. Uh, I, I had a difficult to say this, but I, I want to say this. Probably this is also the first time in my life I say this in public. I don't belong nowhere and I don't have pity of myself that I don't belong nowhere. I feel very well with this, very happy. I feel in a way so happy that I'm beyond belonging now. And I hope one day my own children understand that because I would really uh, wish that for most people to belong nowhere anymore. It is a, this belonging is connected to your comfort zone. And as long as everybody is in his own comfort zone, and saying, yeah, I belong there and I feel okay there. That is your mind who doesn't want to adapt to change. The mind has it really difficult to accept change because in the last uh, conversation we had last week, I said there is one constant in life and that constant is that everything changes all the time. And I see it with my friends who, who are in politics in Belgium, for example, and they were at the local level, then they transcended, they go to the national level, and then they go to the European level. And what I see is that they think their mind is more open while their mind is absolutely not. I say your garden, your thinking, your ego, instead that it's limited in the beginning to a village, then to a city, then it was a country, and your garden is still a garden, even if you call it Europe, because there is only the universe. Only all these distinctions that we make, countries, we created it. The world was created without borders. So we create our own comfort zone while there is only what is. I really, so when I do a mediation, I try to understand everybody because I try to make people understand each other is that they be living in their own space while there is the space of the, the, the other. I'm opening up their minds to make them understand there is the other. And I must say, in Africa, I appreciate a lot. Uh, Victor, I'm going to on, on your Ubuntu part there. Eh? Africans live much more through relationships. It's not about me and the other. They are together. So they are an example of a different way of life. Their accent is not on the individual, but the accent is they live through relationships. So I'm living now here 17 years, so I can say I understand more. I'm not here to tell them what to do. I, where I can contribute, I contribute to progress in life. We have uh, construction, Western construction to try to progress in life, but Africans, they just are. They're really more into being. And this is very important where we can learn from each other. Diversity is very important in life. That's the richness of life, that we are all created different. And we see it as a duality always. While it's not always a duality, it's just part of the whole. And we see duality always as conflict, which is not necessarily conflict. We have to make a decision between what is and what we perceive. And that I, I'm convinced there is something more than your heart and your spirit. Higher consciousness. Higher consciousness is when you touch being beyond intelligence. 
These are a few things I want to share with you. And it is absolutely not my goal to be right or to be wrong because I'm also beyond that. Okay. Yes, Teresa. Yeah. Teresa wanted to say something. Uh, Lisa, Teresa had a hand up. For, for okay. Teresa oh, I, I think that Stefan got there and, and, and really maybe it's Lisa's thing to say, but Stefan, I, you know, hearing you say the sense of not belonging anywhere and it sounds more like you have transcended to this sense of belonging everywhere along the lines of what Lisa was saying that we have to expand this concept of belonging to include all. Um, if, if, you know, even an answer to Vikram, your, your question about why can't we seem to get there, right? Um, why are we still stuck in this, this us versus them where there, there is so much inflicting of injury on others? And um, from Stefan's perspective, we have to find a way to tra transcend um, and, and have a sense of belonging everywhere. No, so, so that was all, but he, he really covered it anyway. Yeah, perfect. He, he so, kept talking and covered my comment. Yes, Lisa. So, so uh, a couple of things. So there's a, a lot actually. Um, first of all, I, I wanted to speak to what, to Jay's, you know, um, one of the things he said about dissonance and resonance and, um, and I have always used the metaphor of a puzzle that all of us are pieces of a puzzle in one big picture. And that in a puzzle, like when I was in Indonesia, I remember that when I said to somebody, well, this is, you know, somebody you really like or you get along with. And they said, Sanang tapiti da beta, which means, you know, I'm, I'm okay with this person, but we don't fit. Now, like th that's where that metaphor first came to me that, oh, okay, so we can really fit and resonate with people who are on our part of the puzzle. But the recognition that there's a huge, large puzzle, that's where we need to be, which is what Stefan is, is talking about. And I also want to talk about, like, I know, you know, that's why I, I think I talked about Gandhi in that sense of the intercultural self, that as interculturalists like you, Stefan, who have, you know, transcended your culture, go back to Socrates and the allegory of the cave. When we are in one culture, we are in that center, we have center circles, but we can't see the outside of that circle because we're in the cave looking at the shadows. Once we leave the cave and we see a larger world, we can never go back and be part of that cave. So in that sense, that Stefan's not belonging but in the other sense, because of the wider sense, we become comfortable wherever we go. We become comfortable in all different kinds of caves but and Liz, all Liz, different Liz, kinds Liz, of- Lisa, just want to, for illiterate people like me, please elaborate on the cave and Socrates, please, because a lot so, of people <laughs> may not know about that. <laughs> so Socrates' <laughs> allegory of the cave is imagine that you are in a cave, you're kind of, maybe you're chained there and your whole reality is looking at shadows. You'll see shadows of things moving across the cave wall. This is your whole reality. And then one day somebody unchains you and you're able to leave the cave. This is also used um, and, and you go out in the world. And if you come back to the cave and you tell the people, this is what I saw, they would never believe you. This kind of also the frog in the well is also another metaphor that's used, which is a frog jumps out of the well and then sees the world and jumps back in. Nobody's going to believe them. So that what you see in that greater amount, a lot of people can't see that experience. And that's what Stefan is describing. He, he, he's jumped out of the you know, cave a long time ago. So, um, so it's that, you know, that, that, that one of the things that if you become what we call a cultural marginal, you can be constructive in helping people who are in the center who don't have a vision, you can be constructive in helping them have a vision because you have that vision. And, and to me, that's exactly what Gandhi did. That was exactly what the movement of Gandhi did was to use that. He, he became, a very, became a very constructive marginal and he had that wider vision. And that belongingness is that also moving to that sense of that wider vision, that it's okay if I fit on this side of the the puzzle 
that's okay. But I know on the other side, somebody really doesn't agree with me, but that's okay because, you know, that's where the sky is or wherever those puzzle pieces are, you know, maybe, I mean, I'm a little bit of a hippie, so maybe I'm up there in the sky floating around. I don't know, but. Um, <laughs> what what are you having? What are you having these days? The substance abuse? <laughs> I can't tell you. I mean, maybe I had some good brownies. Don't float uh, away, but just don't float away. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, I think of it that way. I think that there is, you know, there's a wider picture and everything that everybody said when I hear it fits all together okay, so in that wider picture. And there's no disagreement with either one of us. There's only a different perspective. Yeah, I just wanted to add when I speak myself of the comfort zone, of course, I don't judge it. I understand very well uh, when people are in their comfort zone and I hope they are happy in their comfort zone uh, because I wish just the best for everybody. But uh, there is a kind of but because uh, it is important if you can transcend it, it's easier. It makes your life much easier because you can uh, take distance once you are there of your own thinking, your own perceptions, your own, you, you recognize your thinking, you recognize your emotions. It's, uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Jay, Jay wanted to say something, but only oh, thing I, before I, that, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I just wanted to say that sure. Stefan, like Lisa said, is gone out of the cave, but we don't believe him when he comes back and he's telling us stories <laughs> about what's outside. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Jay, please. I, th I think we have a dilemma in our field, in the mediation field, in the, I call it creative conflict engagement field to get away from management or resolution or transformation. And, and the dilemma I think is, is taking seriously our commitment to diversity. Mm -hmm. Clearly all of us are committed to individual diversity, right? That's, that's the, liberal, the liberal enlightenment approach that everybody has radical choice about their own lives. I think where we're not, so committed to diversity is in group identity. Because it's quite obvious that so many of our conflicts in the world and the more violent ones are about group identity. So an answer is let's get rid of it. Let's just be universalists. Well, maybe when the Messiah comes, but you know, the Messiah often has a kind of a, a genocidal notion that that one group is going to bring the Messiah and the other groups are going to have to melt into it. So I'm not sure I'm looking forward to that either. So I think the human condition is about group identity. I think it is. And, and I'm, look, I'm also an alienated, liminal, um, marginal, unbelonging mediator. That's probably part of our condition of being a mediator. But I think it's very important, almost as a philosophy, to belong. And I made a choice. I grew up assimilated American. I made a choice later to become a Jew. I, I was born Jewish, but it, wasn't, it was actually a negative identity. I then identified, I, I watched my black friends and I said, wait a minute, they don't have that choice. They're always gonna be black. So I have a choice? No, actually I don't have a choice. If I look at my story, I look at my history, I look at my people, I, I'm, I'm part of that peoplehood. And so I'm gonna join that peoplehood and through that identity as a mediator, I'm gonna deeply understand other identities. When I look at other identities through my liminal lens, I judge them. Uh, Victor, uh, Stefan, you're, you, you've transcended that. But when I'm, when I'm liminal and people are fighting over their identities, I say, that's not correct. Be bigger than that. But yeah. when I'm mediating out of my identity, I say, I get it. I understand why you're willing to die for this. Yeah. So yeah. as mediators, and I'll finish, and I'm eager for your input, Stefan. So I think as mediators, we have a dilemma which is we are radical humanists. We believe in everybody and a choice and freedom at a radical level. And yet the world and the biggest context that we're called to address are between groups. And we're not gonna get rid of those. So through our, I think, our own understanding of what it means to identify, we can help those have bigger senses of identities, which are inclusive instead of exclusive. Mm -hmm. Stephen, sorry. But Jay, if you're going yeah. to tell Stephen what to do, can I go yes, and have my yes. dinner, dinner and come back? So <laughs> this is, not uh, is yeah, Vikram, you're a moderator. I'm <laughs> no, sorry. I'll just stop. <laughs> Rosalia hasn't, hasn't. Let's just say if, if this starts, that's a Jay. What you started is something which is not going to. So, okay. uh, I'm there, Lisa. I'm there. Yeah, Stephen. Okay, it's not because I transcend certain things that uh, I don't consider identity important. It is 
very, very important. Okay? It is only when uh, a person buys or her identity con considers herself or himself better than another person. That's absolutely the limit. The most important thing in life is to be. Yeah? Being. You are created to be. So when I coach young Africans here, they are the relationship is more important than the individual. But when I ask them, I ask each one of participants in my coachings, who are you? Who are you? And believe it or not, most of my participants, uh, they are, come from university, they say, never, nobody asked me who I am. And they are emotionally touched when I ask them, who are you? Because of cultural differences. And I say it is important to understand who you are, to, you, to understand what your values are in life. And you, your identity, for example, is partially formed by your values as a community, a Jewish community has their values, other communities, religions have their values. So I also think as a humanity, we have to go back to values. This is very important to, to come together again. To We have our local identity, different kinds of identities. But as a humanity, we also have our identity. What are our values as human beings? Our world values. And what Gandhi did and what these leaders did is to defend defend values they thought if we don't respect those values we are not of value anymore as a human being because that was happening they were oppressed values were not respected because other people were imposing their identity on other people like the colonists did in Africa. Africa was destroyed by colonization. Why? Their identity was destroyed. And they had their values as human beings that were not respected. So, of course, there is identity. Identity is incredibly important. But we have to be hewn back to the essence of humanity again, is to back to our values. Our values are wrongly, uh, we are going the bad way when you value, for example, money too much, which is the creation of our mind. We have to revalue love. We have to revalue friendship. We have to value diversity. We have to value differences. We have to value conflict, but not violent conflict. Yeah. Rosalia, Thank Rosalia, you, is, yeah, yeah. Rosalia is listening, but when Rosalia speaks, then everyone listens. Yes, oh, Rosalia, after everything has been heard, what are you saying? Okay, well, I think everything ties in. Well, first of all, your question, why are we still here today? One word, ego. Everything ties in with the ego, basically. We have to let go of the ego, which is the hardest thing, because everything ties in. Uh, your identity, uh, you know, you're proud to be from this race, or, you, or you're proud to be from this, uh, this class, or successful. You know, like you want you, your students that say they, they want to be um, financially successful. Why? That's tied into the ego, because it represents success, you know, financial success, I'm so and so. I, I'm this or I'm that, or or the, the different um, um, the conflicts that are happening um, between uh, you know different groups. You know, identity group could be um, uh, from uh, classes, uh, from uh, religions. You name it. Okay, um, it comes down to the ego, and and as human beings, it's very difficult for us to humble ourselves, okay, and, and basically say, okay, it's fine, okay, you're different, I, I accept you for the way you are, I'm not, I am not like you, but I respect the fact that you're different, and that's very, that's difficult, because it's easier to take the low road than the high road, that's what it comes down to, and I think Gandhi, that's what he was showing us, because uh, he was, uh, 
you know, everybody was so um, impressed. But he, you know, he he humbled himself. Uh, you know, he, he it was peaceful resistance, but he he humbled himself uh, in his, uh, you know, he really he let go of everything uh, to become the the person that he was, and and you know he had an open mind and and this is what we we should be striving for, but that's a difficult path uh, to follow because it means letting go of preconceived notions uh, and so-called identity or, or certain uh, goals. That's what it comes down to. So that's why we're still here today. I think that's the lesson that many of us have to learn. And um, uh, as long as, uh, <laughs> as long as there's humanity, we're always going to be making the same mistakes and we have to correct them. Um, but after all this, is there no criticism of Gandhi and his concepts about, life or anything else no criticism at all i'm sure there is something that you can criticize yes jay has something to criticize yes jay i i heard he was terrible at raising children just you know just well, we'll come to you lisa we'll come to you we'll, we'll get all no, actually i i was reading in in joseph lelyveld's uh am i am i on yeah yeah you're on yeah so i was reading in a, a biography by joseph lelyveld was very critical biography that Gandhi got very mad at his son for deciding to get married. And he actually called him not my son anymore because he wanted his son to be celibate like him. He wanted his son to be transcendent of the world. Gandhi was an extremist. There's no question. Now, you know, he's an extremist in the sense of his belief system and he thought it was the correct belief system and he would impose it on his family. So no, he wasn't a saint. <laughs> yeah, he wasn't a saint. Um, also, you know, he, he, he was experimenting while he went, right? Lots of things were sort of accidental, right? When did he stop being a lawyer? When he was thrown off the first class train, right? And he was so indignant by his treatment. And then he re realized, you know, he was humbled. He didn't humble himself yet. That he was wearing his three-piece barrister suit, driving, riding in a first class train in South Africa and the police threw him off and called him a coolie. And, and you know, he, he grew up, he was the son of a prime minister. He was, I, I assume he was from the the higher class of of Indian. I don't know. Um, not the son of a prime but, minister, yeah. But well, okay, not not the son of a prime minister. Yeah, yeah. He prime was, minister he was uh, 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 of the of the um, trading class, the business. The trading class. Uh -huh. Anyway, so so you know he was he was experimenting as he went in this notion of of radical belief in in the other. So I was saying earlier that it's easy to hate Putin right now. Um, I'm trying very hard not to. And Stefan, I, I was interested in your notion of the, the Russian soul, because you know, if you study Pro Putin, who's a, who's a thinker, he's a real thinker. Um, he has all sorts of notions about Eurasian identity and Ukraine is, is blocking that. You know, it's easy to call him hate, e evil and, and megalomaniacal, seems to be those things. And yet there is, there is a worldview there. And, and, and we as mediators need to try very hard to see it. Now, I'm using this as a way to talk about a criticism for Gandhi. Gandhi went so far in that, that he wrote a letter to Hitler and he wrote and he, and he addressed it, dear friend. I don't think I could do that. I don't think I could do that to Putin either right now. I don't think I could write dear friend, but I think I could say, Mr. Putin, you have a philosophy and your philosophy of life, I don't agree with. Your strategy of life, I absolutely fundamentally oppose, which is power and violence. But I do understand at root, you have a belief about the Russian soul that's hundreds and hundreds of years old. And there are tens of millions of people who agree with it. So mm -hmm. let's figure out <laughs> how to pursue your goals without killing people. That's what we mediators have to do, right? We have to say, you have a, a reality that's meaningful to you and I'm not oh. gonna dismiss you as insane. Um, but I am going to work with all of my might so that your use of power and violence is transformed into something different. So, so there is a thing is that there is some technologies, there's someone selling a technology where if even if you're not there, that little video of yours plays and everyone thinks you are there. Are you there or is that little video of yours playing that you are there? If you are there, please 
tell us is there any criticism of gandhi okay you're there <laughs> I'm, i'm listening intently trust me but again for me i you know um uh, sometimes take a few notes because it helps my brain process and a while back uh, here i you know i put just this simple sort of to me question of you know how do you belong because if we acknowledge or accept if you're of that mind that aspects of identity are important and there is this seeking to belong how do you belong without creating us versus them and inflicting injury we we're talking about putin or gandhi all these other things that that's sort of what it comes down to to me and if it's the level of self sacrifice and setting ego aside and humbling oneself the way that gandhi did we're going to wait all I'll be long dead before the 90% of the world takes that path just including self right um but to the criticism piece uh you know i i uh i went back a few years ago and got a a masters in conflict resolution because it's something that i wanted to do i don't need to talk about why but it was important to me so i did and in there again shortening the story um did some more more research about gandhi and and came to know some things if they're true right i, I don't know for sure <laughs> <laughs> right um howard wallowitz from the big bang theory says if it's on the internet it's true so i so i read some things that um uh and, and i think jay it was you that maybe used you know imposed upon i mean gandhi had some in his own quest to transcend the world i read a number of things to suggest that he imposed upon certain people in his life including his wife and his children his way of thinking and doing that caused some level of dissonance for them some level of pain some level of disappointment um so and that's just sort of scratching the surface of where those criticisms can be um but you know on the other hand when i think about the incredible self sacrifice that he was willing to make that i'm not likely to make you know about to turn 60 i've got a few years left but it's probably not going to be to that level and so for me it's simply taking trying to look for those things that are of a value that help me move forward as a person so that i hope that by the time i exit this world i'm not the same person i am today and where do i take those pieces that help me in my day to day work um aspire to you know help other people aspire to finding those bridges um finding those ways of being together as a family um because i do sort of had that fundamental belief when you have children together you are a family forever and so for me the day to day work back to the mediation pieces how do we help that family find a new way of being that is somewhat an essence of belonging within that family system and that family structure it, that that is that is not destructive that that isn't an us versus them in in a in a negative way and even parents who have this child become a, a a me versus you same as in us versus them so um th- those are my so no I, i wasn't frozen and i hadn't left you uh just trying to digest um some of these these folks who are much more eloquent than i am and much more learned in you know looking at these these sort of larger philosophies but those are some of the the basic things that apply to me but there is there is a company who is selling that concept that you send us a little video and we'll put it into the meetings when you're sitting in a meeting everyone will think that you're oh. there but there's someone right. who is doing that okay. yes victor we need lots of criticism do we need lots of it i don't know but let's get some uh, maybe before i get to criticism i'm um, just allow me to weigh in on 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 transcendence and 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 belonging maybe i i am of the view that you can only transcend when you have understood your essence and um i'd like to use a metaphor that essence is a high hanging fruit compared to um belonging which is a low hanging fruit from where i see it um one of the most prolific individuals in my bible has to be paul and and paul says that he was a jew to the jew and he was a greek to the greek and he was a gentile to the gentile and that can only be possible because he understood the essence of his life now paul was born a jew he he was brought up in a jew um society 
he had schooled through the, uh, um, the Jewish system of education. But the fact that he is able to divorce himself from a Jew when he is interacting with Gentiles, um, the fact that he's able to um, maybe morph, let me, let me say he is some kind of an amoeba. The, the fact that he's able to blend and gel into these um, societies and communities, that goes to show us that this man truly understood his essence and his essence here transcended the whole concept of belonging. Because uh, mm -hmm. truth be told, uh, we've all been raised in a world where things are black and white. And, and, and that's where belonging uh, um, is sort of caught in between these two, uh, uh, para, between these two parallel structures, white and black. Uh, but essence goes beyond uh, um, black and white. That, that's how I look at transcendence and, 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 and belonging. And, and of course, essence. My criticism uh, towards Mahatma Gandhi, it, it's almost difficult to critique him. But anyway, I'm going to say this. Um, the fact that he was a product of an unequal society and the fact that he never uh, spoke against it, uh, to me, that raises eyebrows from where I sit. Thank you. That's it. That's it. Okay. But okay. I mean, I don't know. Rosalia and Stefan, you haven't had your thing. So, Rosalia, you want to anything that you wanted to say? In terms of criticism, uh, I, I actually I'm fine. I, I did say okay. my um, my okay, piece. That's it. Yeah, um, Stefan. Stefan, anything in there, Stefan? No, I think there is always uh, like this uh, kind of the duality everywhere. So uh, there is good, there is bad. They are part of a whole. So yeah, I I don't need to criticize. Uh, I I focus on the good. So. And I understand very well when somebody is going for a goal, for his essence, eh? your essence is different than the essence of somebody else, which creates automatically conflict and conflict is natural just because of the differences we are created with. So that's the richness of diversity. Lisa, you are going to come in again the same thing on yes. this topic also last but not least on this topic. We'll go further so, there. But yeah. So, I mean... I think all of the things, you know, that about Gandhi, I've also heard about the family and and uh, his struggle with that. And but I also want to say that we are all human beings and we know that. I mean, there isn't anybody who's perfect. So we can always find something wrong. Abraham Lincoln once said, you know, if you look for the bad in people, you'll be sure to find it. Yeah. Um, so I always try to not look for the bad in people and look for all of the good because that's what I want to inform me. But even that having been said, I just had a funny thought. I was imagining, you know, Gandhi out with, you know, hundreds of thousands of people following him and he's demonstrating and, you know, all these people are doing what he says and he goes home and, uh, and his wife says, ah, what are you saying? I don't want to listen to you. <laughs> <laughs> and imagine that, you know, that human, natural human instinct of what do you mean you can't listen to me? You should do what I say. So we always have to remember we're all humans after all. And we are all in the same, you know, same category together. We have families, we have children, we have this, and we struggle with that, with our lives in the outside world and our lives in the inside world and our families. So, you know, Gandhi was like us. And, oh, I hate to say this, an ordinary person with an extraordinary voice. <laughs> okay, she's, she's pushing her own little, that show she started. She started a show called I didn't that. say that, though. I didn't go directly. <laughs> so all of this promoting, people promoting themselves, not allowed. Hey, okay. why not? Okay. You promoted okay. yourself on my show. Why not? <laughs> never, never. <laughs> you guys okay. the mediator? <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, no. Okay, this was just preliminary discussion. Now the topic was Mahatma Gandhi and mediation. So was he a mediator and what did he mediate? So, it, so this will start from the reverse. We'll, okay, maybe Jay, then we'll start from you, please. Because now we get into the topic. So I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if he was a mediator. I mean, it, it, because he, he had such clear principles of what was right and wrong. And he was an advocate. He was an activist. He had an agenda. And he was, he was pushing that agenda um, from, from the time of his awareness until he died. 
Um, now he also, it was also coupled with the spiritual agenda and, and sometimes his political agenda was set aside while he felt that spiritually he was sacrificing too much of himself and he would withdraw. And then he'd go back into the political fray and he'd fight to win. Now he'd try to win nonviolently. You know, the, the politics of nonviolence grew out of his, his spiritual approach and the politics of nonviolence is completely secular. Gene Sharp, right? Who actually was, was pretty important in the Arab Spring. A lot of the youth in, in Egypt apparently had read the books by Gene Sharp about how to foment a nonviolent revolution inspired by Gandhi. So, so I think Gandhi was a strategist. And, and now his ability to go between different communities while being part of one of them and to have the trust and the respect of, of various classes and various ethnicities, that made him a mediation-like person, a mediator-like personality. And in, in that way, played kind of the third sider role all the time, even within his own community of, of having an outside perspective and trying to widen people's views to incorporate each other. Um, but, and, and you know, I think when you talk about, you know, I, I, I listened to your session with Bernie, Bernie Mervikram, and I know he's coming back again. And Bernie's talking about how mediators ought to be on the side of justice and ought to be advocating for transformation. Um, Jim Lowey, one of the founders of our field, talked about uh, us as conflict resolutionaries, which means we have an agenda. Um, but if you're mediating, so let's go back to the case at hand. If I could mediate between Putin and Zelensky, would I do that? And the answer is yes. Do I think one of them is more right than the other? Yes. Am I able nonetheless to set myself aside and say, I'm going to help to find perspective of each of these people within my own self? the meaning of identity, the meaning of belonging, all these things we're talking about. That for Putin, that seems to be driving. And for Zelensky, clearly that's driving, right? Now, unfortunately, this would have ha had to happen before war or after war. We're pretty much useless in the middle of war as a field. But before war, um, to be able to use the Gandhian approach to say, let's incorporate each other by deeply respecting the other's personhood. That I think is something that we can and should learn from Gandhi about how to be mediators. I, I want to say something because I, I need to leave. Since when this, this started happening, Lisa, that you wanted to say, so you want to say something and you get to say it when you want to say it. Has it ever happened? Ever on my show? I am shows? asking your permission because <laughs> okay, I need okay, to no, leave. No, that's okay. No, that I, am going to leave. I told you you needed a <laughs> mediator. That was an indirect, that was an <laughs> indirect ask. Okay, please, Lisa, tell us. <laughs> But you also have to tell us, did Gandhi mediate? And when so, did he mediate? Where did he mediate? Something on I, that also. I agree with, with, with Jay in the sense, yes and no. Um, yes, he mediated because he met with a lot of politicians in private meetings and he brought them together and he took that stance of helping them listen to one another in that role and many, many times, you know, throughout history, you hear about him meeting and having either private meetings or, or meetings in a group where he brought together the group to agree to some consensus. Mm -hmm. But no in the sense that no in the sense that was it our Western style mediation? Probably not. He took on more of the role of a traditional mediator that comes from the history of mediation, more of a, a role that we see in um, indigenous societies, that kind of thing as, as the elder with the wisdom at the table. And so, you know, in that way, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. I think that we as mediators also have to let set aside our notion of what Western, what mediation is and allow a wider sense of what mediation is. If the, if the accomplishment is that people start to get together and start to understand one another and they start to drive you know, the agreements, then that's mediation. And um, we may not agree with the process, but that's okay because we want diversity as well and we can have diversity of process. Those are my closing thoughts. Bye, y'all. I gotta go. I also <laughs> need to go. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it can, uh, it was okay. Such a bye, pleasure. Lisa. Thank you. It was, good to see you. It was yeah. a pleasure being here. Thank you, Vikram, yeah. for inviting me.
Thank you, Lisa, for coming in. And Vikram, I, I also need to go. And even my battery of my laptop is, is going. I'm, uh, you know where I am. I'm in Burundi. But, but Stefan, the concept was that the topic has just started. That This is where the topic no. is about mediation. And I really want to understand where did Mahatma Gandhi mediate? Okay, so, what, what Lisa, so, because what Lisa uh, said, to, and she left. No, I'm just okay, saying, okay, to, no, you finish, your battery is finished. To me, it's, it's, very, it's very simple. The moment you take a position, you are not a mediator, you're negotiating. The moment you take a position, you are not neutral anymore. People come to you because they, they want to be in a neutral zone. And this, this impartiality, this independence as a mediator is very important. How can you mediate in a situation where you are in a position? That's not mediation. That's the essence of mediation is to be, uh, is not taking a position. Yeah, well, not, we'll come to that because, uh, Stefan, because what uh, Jay was discussing in terms of what Bernie Mayer has written with Jacqueline, that yeah. book, The Neutrality Trap. But what I'm saying is that, yes, that's a good discussion that, okay, you don't have to be neutral and whatever. But at the same time, when we look at the Gandhi situation, is it that he's not neutral and still not pushing his point, or is he not neutral and he's pushing his point? Is he getting That's them right. to do something which he wants them to do, be it what Lisa is saying, getting them together, have a discussion, but do what I'm telling you to do? Was it that? I mean, I really want to understand what how what you look at that. I'm any of you wants to come in? Rosalia wants to come in. Yeah, Rosalia. Um, okay. Well, uh, I don't think Gandhi was a mediator. I think he was an advocate. Um, but he used mediation uh, techniques uh, like negotiation, but he definitely was not a mediator because he had um, a political agenda. Uh, he went about it in a peaceful way, um, you know, nonviolent communication and uh, basically resistance, nonviolent resistance, but he was definitely not a mediator. But we can learn from him as mediators. And I agree with what Stefan says, the minute you take a position, then, you know, you could kiss your mediation goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> and then basically you're a negotiator, you're a negotiator, you're, you're, you're an advocate. So that's how I see him. That's, okay. I mean, I'm not uh, well learned on Gandhi. I've, I've read, um, I've, I've read the, some of his works, but um, I'm not an expert. So that's my view. Um, that's my perspective. So Yes. That's all I have to add. <laughs> yes, Victor. Victor, yeah, please. Um, I, I want to agree that no, he wasn't a mediator, and yes, he was a mediator. And my argument is no, he wasn't a mediator, but nonetheless, uh, there are values of mediator, mediators that we see him embody. Um, as a mediator, I think he was an, it's an inference that I want to make. I want to make the inference that he was a mediator because um, he was a founding father. I want to look at it from a parental perspective. Now, every parent is a mediator, whether they know it or not. And, and uh, but Gandhi being a founding father of India, um, we can draw the inference that definitely there are times and circumstances where, uh, and I think um, Lisa sort of made a reference to this, that, you know, as an elder, as a, as a statesman, you know, you, you have people from different sides of the island divide coming to you uh, for wisdom and, and, and things of that sort. So I want to uh, think of him as a mediator within that prism, not a traditional mediator, but an unconventional mediator. Thank you. Jay has been wanting to say something. Yes, Jay. Actually, no. no? Okay, no. no because I'm no. telling you, this is, yeah, Teresa, please. So, so I'll go because, because we haven't defined mediator or mediation in this conversation. And so whether he's a mediator or not is going to depend largely on that definition of mediation. And don't ask me to define it because I'm going to trip myself up as I try because every word in that definition has so much meaning and so many, you know, parts and pieces um, that, that we would have to decide, do we, do we agree on the essence of mediation? I certainly don't know the totality of his life, um, but I think the other thing specific to Gandhi is, well, at which point in his life are, are we talking about it and are we focusing on? I suppose, again, because I don't, don't know all the information, even if we go back to sort of his awakening as a lawyer, where he said the real, you know, the, the true job of, or not job, but 
you know, uh, goal of a, a, a lawyer is to, to bring parties together. Well, as far as I know, he was in the role of a lawyer for one of those people, right? I, I don't know that fun, the, the answer to that fundamental question. Did he ever step out of that? And as a non-lawyer, I mean, as a lawyer say, I'm no longer a lawyer for either of you. I'm helping the two of you have a conversation and hopefully resolve a, a, a conflict. But then we get into, is it enough to define a mediator as someone, as we've spent most of our time talking about today, sort of, you know, helping people understand each other and have these necessary conversations without reaching agreement? Or is, is the essence of mediation that we're, we're trying to help people resolve or transform or manage their conflict and come to agreement? So for me, I, I don't know the answer to the question, was he a mediator? I agree with everything everybody else said. Um, but, you know, we would need the, the next couple of hours, um, Vikram, to, to, to define what, what, what's mediation. But it looks like Jay has a definition. Let, let, me, let me try. Let well, me before, try. No, before, Jay, before Jay comes in, I'll sure. put out the definition that I'm using uh -huh. because I use the definition from the Singapore Convention. And I, li I like that def definition because it's nice and broad and uh, it covers things for me. So this is my definition of mediation. Can you okay, read it? So, it yeah, okay, yes. The, it defines it as a process irrespective of the expression used or the basis upon which the process is carried out, whereby parties attempt to reach an amicable settlement of their dispute with the assistance of a third person or persons lacking the authority to impose a solution upon the parties to the dispute. This is in the context of international commercial uh, disputes and the mediation there. Of course, the Singapore Convention is there, that, but I am taking this definition. And in this kind of a situation, did he have the authority to impose a dis solution? Moral, maybe. So, yes, Jay, please. Okay, so I'm going <laughs> um, to see if I can try to try to give a definition in uh, just a couple of minutes. I, that that definition is 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 quite legal based, as you just described. It's and, and I think in our field, particularly when we're talking about identity conflicts, we need a fundamentally different definition. So let me first go to neurobiology quickly. There's an author named Daniel Siegel who, who writes about the neurobiology of we. And what he says is that our brains are organized so that we do two things with it. We do three things with it. And he uses this as a metaphor for, for humanity also. That we differentiate, we distinguish right? Or if we talk about stages of life, right? We, we differentiate from our, our mother as youth, and then we become stages of life. And so we differentiate. That's essential. We do it individually, and we do it collectively. We join groups, and my group is different from that. We also link. We make linkages. And the, and, and the two things is what our minds do. Our minds separate, distinguish, and they link. And when we have those two together, then we have what he calls integration. We have an integration of, this, this, of separation and of linkage. If we have one or the other, if we just have linkage, then we have the angry hordes who are trying to destroy the other, right? If we only have differentiation, sorry. So, so integration is where we're seeking and that's what I think mediation is about. Mediation is trying to create that third way across the differences. A mediator is that person who is trying to support that third way approach. And, and the mediator, he or him or themselves, may have a very strong position. But when they're mediating, their job is to be disciplined about their bias. They can't be neutral. I don't think a human being can be neutral. But they can be unbiased or at least multipartial. Now, Gandhi gave a wonderful quote, I think, about the problem of, of a compromise-based mediation process. And this is why I think maybe he was a mediator, because he said this is... He said, all compromise is based on give and take, but there can be no give and take on fundamentals. Any compromise on fundamentals is surrender, for it is all give and no take. So for him, fundamental was this inner quality of moral life, uh, inner quality of life and relationships. And he wouldn't give into that. That we have to have, right? So, so the compromise approach, when it comes to fundamental issues, not about money, not about resources, but about identity, about existential issues. And, and in that sense, Gandhi was always about trying to help each, all the different groups, all the different religions, all the different philosophies, accept the fundamentals of human dignity, of human respect. 
of reverence for life, which was Albert Schweitzer really building on Gandhi. So, so in that sense, Gandhi embodied mediation, right? Even though he, was, he was, had a bias, he had a perspective, he had a, a posi posi pos position and an agenda. And yet over this, and this might be connected to all the things that we were saying, and Steph and your notion of transcendence, that ultimately Gandhi was about bringing people to that transcendent approach. And in that sense, he was embodied the notion of mediation of helping people find that integration across difference and find that linkage uh, across across differentiation. So <laughs> um, I think we need a very complex definition of mediation, actually, when we're talking about these fundamental axes. Yeah, I think we need it. Yeah, but I think maybe on a separate thing, we'll discuss this aspect because of the fact that of course, again, back to that neutrality thing that we were talking about and what Bernie talks about. But the thing is that you, if you take, you have a stand and then you're sitting in a mediation. Was he doing that? And very nice, everything good that let's take it the process in this way. Let's hear everyone out. But was the outcome already planned? <laughs> so one is be not being neutral and other is this is the way this has to go. And now I'm going to take everyone with me but I will take them where I want them to go. Was it? Well, but, I, but I'd like to push back on that, Bikram, because I because if if I'm right that his plan was this acceptance of fundamental human dignity, that was it, and everything else was a means that was that could be adaptable. You could compromise on various means. In fact, I don't think he was very happy with the ultimate political settlement, <laughs> to put it mildly, right? It, he wasn't happy because ultimately that what wasn't in human dignity and respect for for each for everybody was was at the basis. There was, you know, he witnessed and, and it was when he went back into fasting, all of the violence that came out of, out of the effort to try to find that human dignity. So he was pushing an agenda, but that agenda was not necessarily a particular political position as much as a stance about human dignity. Because the thing is that when you say that not having the authority to impose a solution, which is what I was, why I brought that definition out is that sometimes the moral authority, if you have that moral authority in that kind of a situation, is it right for you to be calling it a mediation, whatever word you want to use it. That's why the, again, the definition, whatever the expression used, it doesn't matter. But at the end of the day, if you are, you have that authority should, would you be a mediator? Should you be a mediator? Was he a mediator? This is what I'm wanting to bring out. So I don't know, Stefan had something to say. Yeah, Stefan, please. Yeah, um, yeah, it's not easy because there are so, what we see now in this, in our discussion is that there are really different perspectives. And uh, it, it is uh, the point, your perspective for me, it's very difficult because I, 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 to me, neutrality uh, is very important uh, uh, as a mediator. For example, um, I give you an example of here in Burundi. Nelson Mandela was a mediator uh, in the Burundian conflict between the, the, the ethnic conflict here in, uh, in Burundi. And uh, I'm a fan of like Gandhi, Nelson Mandela, but sometimes uh, people are not mediators. Mediators, they are neutral and impartial to the conflict. And to me, as you, when you are, for example, saying you're a professional mediator, is that there is, I teach people skills here. I'm, I'm a coach. I, the importance of skills is very important. The, your eyes, life is easier when the more skills you master. Mediation is a skill. You can born with a talent as a mediator, but that doesn't mean you, you will become skilled at it. Sometimes people who learn their skills become more uh, efficient and performant uh, developing their skills than somebody who is talented but didn't develop the skill. And I think in, when you talk about mediation, when you are not neutral to a conflict, you cannot, it's about problem solving. What is the goal of the mediation? The goal of a mediation can be, be coming to peace, can be coming to balance, can be coming to an agreement. It can all be different goals. This is very important to define when you start the mediation, when you are bringing two people together, is that you ask them, 
okay, we are meeting. What will be the goal of our meeting, the goal setting? What are your goals? What are your goals? But if I am not neutral as a mediator to the goals of the parties, this mediation cannot work. It is impossible because you always will be influenced. Normally, you are only a channel. You are nothing like a mediator. You are just a channel to, through which the parties communicate to each other. And, by, and you use listening techniques and you mirror the parties to each other. I have sometimes parties that I do the reframing and that I say, so did I understand you well? This is what you want. So when, because it comes out of my mouth at the mediator, the parties are sometimes shocked or surprised to hear themselves what they want. Because if it comes from them, it's what they want. And you don't know why they are taking that position or this attitude or whatever. But because when you are a mediator and you're reflecting what they say, they see themselves and they cannot believe that's what they want. So, but if I am not neutral to this conflict, you cannot do that because your mind is taking positions, is taking sides. You have to be neutral, as neutral as possible. It depends, of course, also of the nature of the conflict, what your conflict is about and what is the goal you want to reach as parties, do you want to get out of the conflict? Do you want the solution? Do you want to come to peace? Which are all different things. That's why, Jay, I told you that the discussion has just started. I have another that definition. I have another <laughs> definition, by the way. Yes, yeah? just about. With, with, and my definition, it involves neutrality. Yeah. So it means uh, it's a neutral, confidential, autodetermined process whereby the parties are assisted by an impartial, neutral, independent person, which is the mediator, to come to the resolution of their conflict. So, and I don't need no text, nothing. I master mediation. A mediator has to be confident, confident about being a mediator. The more you, you master a skill, the more it's, compart it's part of your being and part of your subconsciousness. You become a mediator. You're not playing the role of a mediator. So it's a choice you make. I'm just uh, trying to get some reactions here. Huh? You'll get, you'll I, I get lots some. of reactions, but Jay will definitely want to react. But no, before no, that, that go first or anybody else. Bef yeah, before that, I, Teresa says she has a limitation of time. So yeah, me too. Teresa, you can put across your point by, while you're there. So Rosalie also has a limitation of time. I don't, so not a problem. <laughs> but but Teresa, can we, you, yeah, yeah, sorry, can we continue this discussion? Uh, can you okay, hold? Well, can you uh, organize another? Uh, yeah, yeah, part maybe, three. Yeah. We'll have part three. We have had part, part one. We, now this is part two. We we'll have part three. This is because now we've I, at least gone. Well, look, the basics about Mahatma Gandhi and all the good things that he mm -hmm. spoke about is done. That needed to be done. It took two hours. It, I mean, it could have taken longer also, but okay, it's taken two hours. We got that out of the picture. Now let's talk about mediation. But that is where the focus for me is about mediation yeah. but at the same time i keep saying my this what i call this my dispute resolution revolution so I, let's i would want to focus on disputes maybe not the larger conflicts maybe just the dispute part of it and his experience with those disputes and how he went across if there are some examples that people want to bring out we can do that but if Teresa, you wanted to say something no, I was just letting you know that I have to leave soon. I'm, you know, really enjoying all the conversation. I don't, I don't um, really have anything to add to what uh, Jay and, oh, and, and oh, Stefan oh. are saying. I think that as we, as we look at this concept of mediator and mediation, I, there's going to be lots of different definitions depending on the, the context that we're, that we're talking yeah. about. I'm in a, yeah. a state yeah. in the United yeah. States that has a, um, statutory definition yeah. um, of, of mediation and, and mediator. And so I, I can um, disagree with that, <laughs> but at the end of the day, we move over into my real world day to day. If I, if I wish to make a living being a mediator here in the state of Florida, I need to pay really close attention to 
those statutory definitions and the guidelines that go along with them, which are not static. They, they are refined, thankfully, they are refined and changed as we, as we, as we know and understand more things, in, including like the concept of neutrality and, and what, that, you know, what that, that means in the context of day-to-day -day work. So um, I, I think we, we always have to keep in mind the context within which we're considering this concept of, of mediator and mediation. But Teresa, can you That's just- That's my take, last comment. Can you take out the definition? You have five, five, seven minutes. If you just take out the definition, we'll just have a look at it. We'll come back to that. And I'll uh, look. I also have to go, but I wanted to add to Teresa. Teresa woke something up uh, in my uh, thinking and being in that way that uh, this neut uh, neutrality uh, to be neutral. It's also because we today the goal was also to speak about spirituality today. And I am in this way spiritual that um, when I'm neutral, I'm, I have a neutral energy. I'm talking about my spirituality. The moment I'm not neutral, I'm sending out another energy while I should be neutral at, at a certain moment. So my sp when I'm in my spiritual zone, I, I, that's where, where I, I will be. So because the moment you're not neutral, you have to realize you're sending out energy that is not neutral it goes it, it is about balance and as a mediator you have to look that you are yourself in balance as much as you can towards the conflict towards the parties to towards the whole the moment that you are in unbalance you're not neutral anymore towards the parties or the content. It can be anything. I cannot define it now. It's beyond definition, I think, even. There is some things in life that are beyond definition. No, what we do is let's just have a look at the definition that Teresa is talking about. Okay. And she says it means a process whereby a neutral third person, neutral word you used here, third person called a mediator acts to encourage and facilitate the resolution of a dispute between two or more parties. It is an informal and non-adversarial process with the objective of helping the disputing parties reach a mutual, mutually acceptable and voluntary agreement. So neutral, the word comes in in this definition that Teresa works around. So the, that part of it is something which needs a discussion and it's a whole discussion by itself. It's a whole discussion by itself. And Teresa does like to also use sign language and lip and lip reading for us but you'll have so to I, yes. so i'm gonna i'm gonna leave but I, I completely agree with you stefan and, and also you know back to jay we, we didn't you know don't have time here to get into it but even the fact that neutral is in that definition and we're 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 sort of much further down the road and and talking about the reality of what does it mean to be neutral right. and and how well do we really do as as humans of being neutral in this space where that expectation is set. So. I really want to jump in there. I'd love, to, I'd love you to be able to hear it before you leave because okay. I, I think we have a fundamental problem in our field. And the field is rooted in interests. It's rooted, rooted in a, a diplomatic, political, interest-based approach. And the real work that we have to do in the world is around identity. Whether it's a family identity or national identity or collective, whatever it is. And therefore we need a different set of definitions, which is not uh, look, I have an iceberg model. I'll very quickly describe it. At the top, we have resource disputes that can be settled. And there, your mediator should be neutral. Yeah. Right. Then we have beneath the water, we have goal-based problems that can be solved. Again, your mediator can be neutral. Then we have identity-based conflicts that can merely be engaged. They can't be solved. They can't be solved. They can be understood. They can be accommodated. They can be respected. And here the mediator is deeply biased, deeply biased. And how does the mediator handle that? By becoming disciplined. That's where the professionalism comes from, mm -hmm. not from be trying to become neutral, right? I can, I, can, I can mediate between a black person and a racist white person. I can do it, even though I think the racist white person is wrong. But I can still mediate because my bias, which is that they're wrong, I can control and say, is there any part of this mediation that requires that bias be expressed to help? 
If so, I'll express it. If not, I will discipline it so it gets out of the way. But I know what it is. I accept it. I'm not neutral, but I'm, I'm disciplined about my bias. No, but Jay, what At we the do level, is... again, of disputes and problems, I'm neutral. At this no, what we... level of deep conflicts, I'm not neutral. No, what we do is the, or not on the larger, because this is obviously from the larger perspective of neutrality. What I'm saying, let's for the discussion, this one and the next part three, we'll keep it to Mahatma Gandhi. And of course, yeah. a general discussion on neutrality, we do it separately. We we'll call Bernie yeah. and Jacqueline again, and we'll have that discussion. Because I want right. to focus on th this aspect because of the fact that a lot of people would look at mediation and a lot of people do say Mahatma Gandhi was a mediator. So I want to have that discussion because a certain model, if it goes around, it should also be discussed. And if there is criticism to it, let us also do it because models sometimes go around without going into the base of what the situation was. So we'll look at that. But Victor wanted to come in. Victor, please. Oh, thank you. Um, in my practice, um, my practice may not be as extensive as everyone's a practice, but I've come to realize that neutrality is not cast in stone. There are cases where you need to step out of this zone called neutrality. And this is where I agree with Jay in the sense that where you have a conflict where there is profound um, power imbalance, as, as a mediator, you need to realize that you, you are, you're supposed to facilitate the process. And, and at times, you know, when you are a neutral party, you may not facilitate the process. But then again, I agree that the outcome should be organic. This should be an organic process. And I think a mediator is a pilot. I think we're just pilots. You know, we, we are supposed to pilot um, uh, this process. And at the end of the day, we need to have an organic outcome that is independent of the mediator. So what am I saying? Um, neutrality is, it's not cast in stone. It's not cast in stone. There are certain circumstances where, um, as a mediator, you just be uh, there. Are biases that will, you know, will take control of you. So that, that's my view. Thank you. Because Victor, from the pilot example, what I let's. I mean, look, this is just for discussion. I'm not saying that this is the way it was, but I'm saying that supposing let's look at Mahatma Gandhi as the pilot of the aircraft and tells everyone, please hop in. We will go wherever you people decide to go tells them that they sit in and then he knows he is he's going to Kenya that's the way he that's where he'll be heading and on the <laughs> way he convinces them and talks to them maybe even sits on a fast so that we get to Kenya so that is the kind of background that I am trying to discuss. I'm not saying that happened. I'm just saying that let's discuss the larger thing because it's sometimes easy not to look at it from the Mahatma. When we put a Mahatma to someone, then we sometimes may lose sight of what the factual part of it is because these are things which get passed on. And sometimes what happens is that the history part of it, the factual part of it gets lost and the concept goes around and sometimes maybe that could be dangerous. So that's why the discussion on it. That's why the discussion on it. I'm not saying that's the way it happened. Maybe he wanted to go wherever everyone wanted to go. We landed up in Kenya. We don't know, but let's just discuss it. Yes, Teresa, I wanted to say bye. Thank you so very much. This is, I, I hate to miss the rest, actually, but I, I am going to need to no, go. There bye. might not be the rest because obviously, look, Jay's taken a break. He's come back, so he's fresh. But I seem to <laughs> do think that a lot of my people... Computer. I have I'll, I'll watch the video later. No, no we, we're yeah. going to have part three. But anyway, we're going to have part I three. I also have to go. Back. I just wanted to listen uh, to Rosalia. Ah, she is, uh, Rosalia, you wanted to say something. And after that, uh, no, I no, would before, uh, before like that, to leave. No, you, you said that you're going to listen to Rosalia and then leave. So before yes. she even gets in, I am going to take you through quickly what happened in March. Because I haven't done my bit, which I always do very quickly. So this is what happened in March. We had media experiences. We had heart, soul, and spirituality discussion. This is part of that mediation vision 2026, evolution of mediators and mediation. Then we did, as we celebrated International Women's Day. There were 25 women from about, I think it was 17 countries. We yeah. had got their view. All videos are available at my YouTube channel. Details are available on mediatorvikram.com. I'm doing it really fast, Stefan, because <laughs> you want to leave. This was a discussion on mediators, mediation, and global problem solving, which is one of the topics that I've put out for discussion in Mediation Vision 2026. There are all of them on mediatorvikram.com. Please have a look. You want to have discuss any of them? Please tell me. 
in conversation with beautiful mind people with the media mindset of stefan started that whole series and of course like i said rosalia has been there this is online mediation as part of that thing very interesting he's he keeps he talk, spoke about how 20 years back he was looking at the online world very interesting discussion and then we had this discussion stefan was there very interesting discussion this is philosophy as the topic then we have kyrgyzstan big m from there big m actually she say pronounces it big m i was asking about it means it means queen in hindi we say big m so the whole same the word goes around and then what do we have after that then we have this happening right now then we have andrea talking about women in mediation but all those women who were part of that discussion international women's day now let them talk about it separately because they, they didn't get too much time obviously but 25 women only went on for three hours so they only i'm sure did not I mean, they didn't get too much to talk about and then we have bernie mayor coming on saturday then we have this is what i'm trying to put it out promoting mediation this is a group general council of a large company which is about, i think about 7 billion dollar turnover so him talking about his experience where i was a mediator talking about his experience but this is also important for me to put this across and for, up till now it's been the mediator perspective but let's look at the user experience also and then this is what i was saying this stefan maybe you could attend this this is also a workshop so she's written this book the mediator school toolkit formulating and asking questions so you mm-hmm. can drop any, any all, all of you can i mean all of you can the link remains the same so please drop in and then of course last day of the month then i put out this april so we i'm asking for people to come in if they want to be speakers for their heart soul spirituality and mediation so please to let me know and then we have of course from kazakhstan rosana on 2nd april danny danny weinstein on 9th this would be okay this is the 9th april this is what i was saying this is that uh, thing jay that i was saying that world creativity and innovation days on 21st april so we'll have a discussion on creativity innovation and mediation open mm-hmm. to whatever you want to discuss and i think at this stage that's about it there, there is going to be lots more i'm definitely going to happen things will happen but this is what broadly it is yes now is okay please okay i'm going to make it very quick uh basically vikram your um analogy of um you know uh, mahatma gandhi get, taking us on a plane right <laughs> and then and having a destination what that um makes me think of is a different models of me we're going to get into a discussion of different models of mediation i know you don't like this <laughs> but the first thing that i thought of was directive mediation um that's what popped in my mind so i have a feeling that if we take that route this is where we're going to be headed we're all going to be going towards well maybe he was applying this type of model of mediation um in some of his discussions or his negotiations or or because i still um i still stand by my <laughs> point that i don't think he was a a mediator in the sense that uh, in our definition of mediation but he did apply uh mediation skills to his advocacy uh, um agenda basically well, actually, well that's yeah, course, yeah, please please yeah. that that's what i wanted to add but i i i'm not going to go into it because it's 12:37 here <laughs> i have to get back to <laughs> no. um, you know when you come to my shows you keep at least 3 hours <laughs> <laughs> well i'm how working long, how long did your how long did your episode of in conversation the beautiful mind go but i mean i'm i'm, I'm uh, at this moment i'm being uh, lent to you by uh, compliments of uh, <laughs> <laughs> the government of Canada. <laughs> oh, yes. But, you know, so I really have to get back. You, you make Canada uh, proud. I'm sure they'll be. <laughs> I don't know about that, but I there's <laughs> have much more uh, uh experience and more wonderful uh, mediators here, but uh, uh because, okay. So we'll continue that discussion. We'll continue the discussion on So I discussion. look forward to uh I I mean I've enjoyed this episode. I, I you know, everybody's uh, has so much Uh, to bring i i think we've only scratched the surface exactly. and I, i there's a lot more uh uh that i think we we can uh contribute uh, and with also with other uh uh panelists I, i'm sure that uh, you're probably going to invite <laughs> so yeah. on that note i really have to go i i i really miss i i'm 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 sad to say that i have to go <laughs> <laughs> I would love to listen to what everyone else is saying. Because I want to I want to pick up your your metaphor as yep. well very quickly. Yep. Um because you know you sort of you're leading the witness here which is yes of course if if he tells us that we're going on an airplane and go anywhere we want and then he takes us to a destination so that's not our idea of a mediator but if he says I have a political philosophy 
I have a spiritual approach, which says that human beings and the dignity and respect of all human beings to each other for all life is fundamental to everything I do. Now, I'm going to help you guys figure out how you're going to get there your way, but that's where we're going to go. He, that could still be a mediator, hmm. particularly if he says it in the beginning. Human dignity, respect of each individual, respect of difference, that's fundamental to everything we're going to do in my mediation room. How you guys decide to agree to get there, that's your choice. But I'm getting you to a certain place that we've all agreed is an essential shared certain place. That's but, that. But, but yeah, supposing from that perspective, I, I'm, I'm on a higher moral ground. And I said, look, if all of you look at everything from a spiritual perspective and honesty and whatever other good things that are, you will also come to this higher moral ground. Right. So come here, listen to me, do what I tell you to do. But, you'll reach but it doesn't have to be so lofty. It can simply be, do we all agree that respect is the beginning, the middle and the end of our process? And they'll say, yes. We'll say, okay. Then I'm going to mediate a process which is going to ensure that we talk respectfully, we pursue solutions that are respectful, and the outcome is such that life is, is revered and supported. So there is a universal truth. There is a universal truth. Yes, we'll all maybe. get there. We'll all get there. <clears throat> it could be. And it could be that it's as simple as, you no, know, I imagine that all of us mediators have such, such uh, preferences. They're usually hidden. So let's make it explicit. Does that keep us from being a mediator? No, maybe it makes us a better mediator. Okay. On that note, <laughs> I'm going to say goodbye to all of you. Okay, I have to go too. So yes, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, much. Much. you can't, you can't do that. that. Victor, Victor has his hand up. One, but, but I have he, to. He there's he people, uh, there's people waiting it. for me. Just give, so. it, give him a minute to Victor to conclude. I just wanted to say. say that, Jay, I hear you out. There are certain bare minimums that as mediators we expect during the process. Thank you so much. Perfect. So thank you all of you for coming yeah. in. It was okay. a wonderful conversation. We are going to continue yes. this. Thank you, Vikram. Really grateful. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank, thank you, you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Take care.